program. Starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. I knew we were winning, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> I know, Miss Livingston, but I saw it in the paper. He got the commission from Governor Griswold of Nebraska. Gee. And Mr. Benny is now a full-fledged admiral in the Nebraska Navy. In the Nebraska... Oh, I get it. He's an imaginary admiral in an imaginary navy. Yeah, but he's taking it seriously. He made me sew gold stripes on his blue serge suit. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Rochester, how many stripes did he make you sew on? I don't know, but you could cut the sleeves off at the elbow and he'd still be a full admiral. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Get him away from that bathtub before he messes up the whole room. <laughs> oh, Mr. Benny. Say, boss. Oh, Admiral. What? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, it's you, Rochester. Uh, glad to have you aboard. <laughs> Uh, batten down the hatch and sit down. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you want? Your breakfast is getting cold down on the lower deck. <laughs> Well, I can't, uh, I can't leave now. I'm about to engage the enemy. Now what? The enemy fleet is over here. Uh, boss, don't splash water on that bass man. Quiet. Now I swing my carriers around like this and bring my destroyers over to this side and encircle them. There you are, Rochester. Now, if you were the enemy and I had you surrounded like that, what would you do? I'd pull out the plug and ground every ship you got. <laughs> Don't be silly. Being an admiral in the Nebraska Navy is serious business. Aye, aye, sir. And anyway, I'm proud of my appointment. In fact, I'm sorry I didn't stay with her when I was in the service 24 years ago. Yes, sir, military life is a life for me. And those promotions... Now, Rochester, help me take my fleet out of the bathtub and now, then... Oh, so say, boss, I meant to tell you, Miss Livingston called... Oh, yes, yes, I better get ready. Boss, if you're going out, don't you think you ought to take off those medals? <laughs> Huh? huh? Oh, oh, well, half of them on your right side, you're listening to port. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Say, I just happened to think of something. I promised to take my girl, Gladys Dabisco, too. I'll pick her up on the way to Miss Livingston. <laughs> I hope Gladys and Mary are ready when I pick them up. Gladys Zabisco. I've been going with her now for nine years. Oh, hello there, children. Hello, mister. Hello. You know who I am, don't you, children? I'm Jack Denny. Yes, we know. You tell us every time you see us. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you want to know something? Last night, our mother and father were talking about you. Really? Yeah, they thought we were asleep. <laughs> So long, children. Bye, Bye Mr. Mr. Benny. Hey, Sis, what? He looks a lot older than 36, doesn't he? Uh, did you say something, Sonny? No, no, goodbye. Goodbye. See, they're cute kids. But that little boy looks a lot older than seven. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Benny. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, Mr. Kern. <laughs> uh, how's the newspaper been? Oh, fine, fine. Funny, I always seem to run into you on the street. Well, I was just going over to your house to thank you for those stories you gave me. Oh, you mean how I found Mary Livingston? Mm-hmm, and how you found Rochester. Well, I'm glad you liked them. You know, those first two articles were very successful. And now my editor is interested in knowing how you found Phil Harris. Phil Harris. That's right. Well, well, okay. Uh, walk along with me, Mr. Kearns, and I'll give you the whole story. All right. You see, it was ten years ago that I first met Phil Harris. I remember the day well because it was Mary's birthday, and I wanted to show her a nice time. So I got all dressed up and went over to her house and let her make dinner for me. <laughs> and the meal was delicious. I remember we had thick sirloin steaks, smothered in onions, and stripped with bacon. Yes, sir. That was ten years ago. Gosh, Mary, this is a terrific meal. Well, thank you, Jack. Gee, the steak is so tender and so easy to cut. Gee, it just melts in your mouth. Jack, put on your glasses. You're eating the butter. <laughs> Well, anyway, Mary, it was sweet of you to invite me over to your apartment for dinner. And wait till you see the bottle of champagne I brought you for a birthday present. You know, you've heard of those famous imported champagnes like Vintage Premier and Chateau Calais. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is a new brand. Savan Oop. <laughs> you know, uh... Mary, I was just thinking. Here it is, 1935, and it's been three years since I put you on my radio program. It's been over three years. Yep. Say, Mary, what would you do if I gave you a little raise? I'd quit my job at the May Company. <laughs> Don't worry, Mary. You just stick with me. In another two or three years, you won't have to work at the May Company. Except maybe Saturdays. Huh? <laughs> the day will come. Well, let's not talk about that, Jack. The evening's young, and it's my birthday, so let's do something. Well, uh, I was going to suggest something. What? Well, first, let's go over and sit on the sofa. Uh-huh. And we'll snuggle up close to each other. Uh-huh. Then we'll turn the lights down low. Uh-huh. Then we'll tell ghost stories. <laughs> How about it? Well, Mama warned me about everything but this. <laughs> what? Jack, why don't we go out somewhere? Let's go to the coconut grove. Well, maybe we... Hey, wait a minute, Mary. I've got an idea. There's a nightclub way downtown on North Figueroa Street, and there's a new band playing there. Let's see, what's the name of that band again? Oh, yes. Phil Harris and his syncopated serenaders from the Solid South. <laughs> Phil Harris? I've never heard of him. Well, he's just coming up, and I'd like to go hear him, Mary, because, you know, I need a new orchestra for my program. All right, let's go. Okay, now let's see. Where's that nightclub now? Oh, yes, on Figueroa, about six miles east of the La Brea Tar Pit. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mary. Here it is, Mary. This is the place. Holy smoke, what a nightclub. This is an awful joint. Well, Mary, you can't tell anything about it from the outside. Yeah, but look at the name of it, the Ruiz Club. So what? Ruiz spelled backwards is sewer. <laughs> oh, 
All right, what's the difference? Huh? And look, Jack, you have to go down these stairs. Yeah. Okay, let's go down. Watch your step, Mary. <laughs> I go down any farther, I'll get the bend. Here. I think we hit bottom, Jack. Here's the door. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that guy Harris knows all the new tunes, doesn't he? But how can people dance on that bare ground? They probably sprinkle water on it to make it slippery. And it helps keep the dust on, too, you know. Let's find a table. Uh, maybe that man will get us one. Oh, yes. Uh, pardon me, are you a waiter? Oh, well, what do you think I am with this napkin over my arm? A clothesline? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but you're dressed too nice to be working in a joint like this. You know? Oh, you mean these striped pants and this Prince Albert coat? Well, you see, I wear these clothes on my other job. Other job? Yes, I'm an undertaker's assistant. <laughs> oh. It was my idea to put the candles on the table. <laughs> hmm. And now would you like me to find a table and lay you out? <laughs> I mean, seat you? Yes, yes, please. Come on, Mary. Ah, here we are. Now, uh, what would you like to eat? Uh, nothing, thanks. We just came in to hear the band. Here. Well, you might as well order something. There's a minimum charge of 35 cents. <laughs> 35 cents? Well, I'll have a chicken sandwich and a combination salad. And I'll have a steak sandwich and French fried potatoes. Anything to drink? No. You might as well. You've got 15 cents to go. <laughs> uh, well... Bring us coffee. Imagine that waiter, an undertaker's assistant. Jack, look, the show's about to start. Good, I'm anxious to hear this guy, Phil Harris. Hi, you folks, and a good, good evening to each and every one of you. <clears throat> now, <laughs> welcome to our little club. This is your orchestra leader and master of the ceremonies, the one and only Phil Harris. Are you glad to see me? Sir, thank you, thank you, and we have a very lovely crowd here tonight. Hey, Mary, he's got a nice personality, you know? We'll see. And speaking of crowd folks, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the club tonight. The panhandler stopped me and said, pardon me, mister, can you let me have $1,000 and five cents for a cup of coffee? So I said to him, I said, look, coffee only costs a nickel. What do you do? What do you want a thousand bucks for? So he says to me... It's going to kill you, folks. <laughs> he says to me, well, I got to pay my income tax, don't I? <laughs> no, lady, don't explain it to him. If he don't get it, just let him suffer. Let him lay it. <laughs> don't wake him up. <laughs> hey, Mary. Mary, did you get it? I got it all over me. <laughs> Quiet. This guy's good. He's and, good. And uh, here's another one, folks. Uh, this will embalm you. <laughs> <laughs> Embalm you. Uh, did somebody call for me? <laughs> quiet, quiet. Get this, folks. A guy walked up to me today and said, Hey, Harris, uh, where'd you get the black eye? So I told him it was a birthmark. And he said, a birthmark? And I said, yeah, I got it in the wrong birth. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, folks, it's just natural with me. Just natural. <laughs> Yes, that's yes, yes. That's not natural. Now we're rolling all new stuff here. All hey, Mary. Stuff. Hey, Mary. Mary, this guy is terrific. No, really, he'd be great on the radio. He's got something new, something different. Oh, you say that every time you see a man with hair. <laughs> Oh, you just don't know class. Now, folks, for the high spot of the show, I'm going to sing a song I wrote myself entitled, That's What I Like About the Song. Hey, I guess this will be good. You know that, man? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Never alone in the club. Well, folks, 
That concludes our first floor show, but don't go away. There'll be another sensational show in five minutes. <laughs> Mary? Mary, I don't care what you say. That guy Harris would be great on my program. I want to get him over here. Hey, waiter, waiter. Yeah? Will you please bring the, um... <laughs> will, uh, will you please bring the orchestra leader over to my table? I'm sorry. He doesn't come with the 35 cent dinner. <laughs> Never mind the wisecracks. Bring him over here. All right, all right. I don't know, Mary... This guy, Harris, has a great personality. Finger ants, finger ants, all so cupid dolls, gardenias and razor blades. <laughs> Imagine razor blades. Oh, by the way, miss, what's that you've got on your tray there, tied up in pink ribbon? That's a lock of Mr. Harris's hair, 20 cents. <laughs> Well, I don't want it. You better take it. This is the last one left, and we don't share them again till the first of the month. <laughs> now, no, thanks just the same. Say, Mary, she's kind of cute. Oh, and... you fall for it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Here comes Phil Harris. Now, Mary, I want to make an impression on him, and I want you to help me sign him for my show. Tell him what a good boss I am and how swell it is to work on the radio. And above, above all, what a wonderful guy I am personally, you know? <laughs> Oh, but Jack... I... Here he comes, huh? Hey, uh, I understand one of you characters want to see me. <laughs> Why, yes. Uh, yes, sit down. This is Miss Livingston. Hiya, sweets. Hmm. And uh, my name is Jack Benny. Look, bud, I ain't got much time. What did you want to see me about? Oh, I wanted to talk to you about a job. A job? Yeah. Well, look, fella, I know things are tough, but uh, I can't use you. I, I, don't... <laughs> I don't want no new help, kid. No, no, I don't mean that. You see, I have a radio program, and I'd like you and your band to be on my show. Well... I don't know. You see, I've Oh, been but he's here. a wonderful man to work for. He's the nicest boss I ever had. He's just a ginger, peachy boss. So pleasant, so gentle. Mary, so you're pleasant. overdoing it. And stop... Stop licking my hand. <laughs> now, Mr. Harris... Uh, just call me Curly. Oh. Till the first of the month. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes, the cigarette girl told me. Now, Mr. Harris, radio is a different type of work. Uh, you read music, of course. Huh? <laughs> Music, notes, arrangement. What's that on your music rack? Termites, the joint's lousy with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harris, how could you be so young and bright when it's so dark down here? <laughs> you see, Mary, this guy is terrific. Oh, look, I'm only kidding. I've been studying music since I was a baby. Why, when I was six years old, my parents used to take me to the concerts at Carnegie Hall. A six-year-old kid interested in Carnegie Hall? Well, they told me it was a burlesque show. <laughs> A burlesque show? Yeah, how I used to whistle when they took the cover over the bass fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Mary, this guy's got a terrific sense of humor. He'll probably be able to write my gags for me. I'll settle if he can just write. <laughs> now, look, Harris, I want you on my program, so if you'll meet me Sunday morning, he'll... Uh... Uh, wait, excuse me a minute. The second floor show's about to start, and i got to introduce the singer. Oh, I'll wait till you're through. You know, Mary, I think this fellow's... Hey, a... Jack, look who's going to sing, the cigarette girl. Oh, yes. Say, hey, she's cute. You know? And now, folks, I want to introduce our singer, the sweetest little lady this side of Pismo Beach, Miss Trixie Laverne, who will sing a uh, Mahelen, Collie Baby. <laughs> well... <laughs> Can't you hear me calling when the rain and am falling? <laughs> why every day the sun is shining? Why should I be home upon? While my honey dear, while I drive away each tear. Or else I will be melancholy. Oh, yes, I will be melancholy. Or else I will be melancholy. Gosh, 
gosh, Mary, I'm a sucker for sentimental songs. <laughs> hey, Harris! Harris, come here a minute. Yeah? Say, that girl singer you've got isn't bad. That Trixie Laverne. Well, look, that's just her stage name. Her real name is Gladys Zabisco. <laughs> Gladys Zabisco, eh? Say, that's a pretty name, too. You know, I kind of like that, babe. Oh, come on, Jack. Let's get out of here. Why, Mary, you're jealous. <laughs> oh, fine. Hey, Harris, don't forget Sunday. I'll be there. So long, Jackson. Did you hear that, Mary? He called me Jackson. No one ever called me that before. All, All right, right folks. Go. Here's come a on. brand new number I wrote myself called That's What I Like About the South. And that's... And that, Mr. Kearns, is how I met Phil Harris. Well, that really is a story. And I must say, Mr. Kearns, that Phil has been very fortunate in being associated with a great star like myself. A man who's been on the radio for so many years and who every year almost wins the Academy. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Brennan. Here comes my... for the patients and military personnel at the Tawny General Hospital at Palm Springs, Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, you fortunate people, we bring you that star of stage, screen, and radio, and operator of peanut vending machines throughout the Palm Springs area. It's uh, just a little sideline, folks. So while we're working for peanuts, he's got peanuts working for him, and here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I didn't mind you disclosing that I'm the peanut king of Palm Springs, <laughs> but you forgot to mention that I've just acquired the franchise for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. <laughs> you want to watch that, Bob? Well, will, Jack. And another thing, Don, you didn't have to infer that I'm not paying you and my cast enough money for being on my radio show. Well, we're not complaining about the radio show, Jack. It's that evening work you make us do. Oh, a few hours' work in the evening never hurt anybody. I know, but we feel so silly coming to your house and sitting around with those little aprons on and shelling peanuts. (laughs) Well? When it's time to go home, the way you reach in the cuffs of our pants. Well, Don, as long as you're beefing about it, I got a little complaint to make, too. I'm docking you 50 cents for what you did last night. What did I do? Remember that pile of peanuts you sat on? Yes. Peanut butter. (laughs) I'm not going to clog up my machines with that stuff. (laughs) Now, Don, we're here to do a show for the boys' attorney hospitals. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Say, say, Mary, that's a cute outfit you're wearing. Something new? Yes, I just got it. It's a convertible sunsuit. Convertible? You mean you can lift the top all the way to... Jack! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Anyway, I think oh, it's... Oh, say, best... Jack, I meant to tell you, on my way over here, I passed one of your peanut machines, and I saw something I think you ought to know about. What's that, Mary? Oh. There's a kid in this neighborhood who's got a system for getting a lot of peanuts out of your machine for just one penny. A lot of peanuts for a penny. How does he do it? Well, first he steadies the machine with his left hand, and then he puts in a penny with his left hand. Uh-huh. And then he turns a handle with his left hand. So what does he do with his right hand? He picks up a rock and breaks the glass. <laughs> well, how do you like that? There's always somebody trying to put something over on you. But, Jack, he was just a kid. I don't mean just him. You want to know something, Mary? Yesterday I went around and emptied my machines, and when I was counting up the pennies, I found a slug. Imagine anyone being so cheap as to put a slug in a peanut machine. A slug? Let me see it. I haven't got it. I weighed myself this morning. <laughs> and, and you'll never believe this, Mary. You know the little card that comes out with your weight and the picture of a movie star on the other side? Yeah. Well, the card I got had my picture on it. Imagine my picture coming out. Well, what'd you expect for a slug, Clark Gable? <laughs> No, but... Uh... Hi, you fellas. Clap them hands. Stir up some air. It's hot in here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Get ready to laugh up here at uh, Tornage because Harris is on and he's plenty corny. <laughs> 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 ah. <laughs> 
Hey, wait a minute, Jackson. Who penciled that line in my script? Harris is on and he's plenty corny. I did, Bill. I'll teach you to come to rehearsal so you'll know what you're reading. What do you mean, uh, reading? I mesmerized all my stuff. <laughs> oh, fine. Why weren't you at rehearsal anyway? What took you so long getting here? Well, Jackson, whenever I come through this desert country, I visit my uncle. You see, uh, my uncle's a hermit, and I spend a couple of hours with him to keep him from being lonesome. Oh, a hermit, eh? Where does he live? At the Chi-Chi Club. <laughs> at the Chi-Chi Club? Well, how can he be lonesome at the Chi-Chi Club? He's a civilian. Oh, oh. Well, I can see where that would make a lot of difference. Come in. Yes? Are you Mr. Benny, proprietor of the peanut machine in front of the El Paseo drugstore? Yes. Yeah, what can I do for you? I want my penny back. <laughs> what? I put a penny in your peanut machine and nothing came out. Oh, oh. Do I get my penny back? Why, certainly, certainly. Gee, and I thought I was going to have trouble. <laughs> trouble? <laughs> Why, not at all, not at all. Uh, just fill out these forms. In... <laughs> That's all. Huh? No trouble at all, Bob. No trouble at all. Phil, now here are the forms, mister. Go over in the corner and fill them out. Yeah, but I only want my penny back. I know, I know. Just fill out the form and everything will be all right. Okay. Say, Jack, why do you make him go through all that just to get a penny back? I can't help it, Don. The peanut vending business is very legitimate, and I've got to conduct it in a legitimate manner. Jack, do you grow all those peanuts yourself? Of course not, Mary. I have them shipped in. Didn't you see all those sacks piled on the front porch? You mean the ones that said nuts to Benny? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I thought it was fan mail. <laughs> oh, you did, eh? Well, Mr. Penny. Yes? I finished filling out the forms. Now, if you'll give me my penny, I'll go. Certainly, certainly. But first, you've got to get this form notarized. What? <laughs> and fingerprinted. Notarized, fingerprinted. Just to get a penny back. Fill out forms. I didn't want any peanuts in the first place. It's all my wife's fault. I knew the machine was empty, but she goaded me on. I didn't want to do it. And when I didn't get any peanuts, I wanted to forget about it. But no, she didn't get the penny back. Get the penny back. What a laugh. Forms, questions, fingerprints, notarized. <laughs> was every time played by Bill Harris. <laughs> Very short number, Bill. Played by Bill Harris. And he's Don Juan de la Caballero, de la Del Cockwitz Orchestra. Which is a Spanish phrase meaning take the cotton out of your ears, fellas. The music's over. <laughs> Say, Bill, I meant to ask you, where are you living here in Palm Springs? Well, I'm out at the Deep Well Ranch. Being in a cabin or a room? No, in the well. It's crowded out there. <laughs> Where are you living, Jackson? Uh, I've got a house here, Phil. It belongs to William Powell. And we have a friendly agreement. You see, he pays for the electricity, and I pay for the water. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. You're living there for nothing, and you still make William Powell pay for the electricity while you only pay for the water? Yeah, but now I wish it were the other way around. Why? I'm getting awfully thirsty. <laughs> you know, you can live without reading at night, you know. Anyway... Hey, Jack, that's quite a coincidence you're living in Bill Powell's house. He's always been my favorite actor. He's so suave, so sophisticated, so debonair. I agree with you, Don. I think William Powell is definitely in my class. In fact, uh, in fact, the other day as I was walking down the street, some people pointed at me and said, look, he walks just like Powell. They meant Eleanor Powell. <laughs> they did not. Wait a minute, Jackson. Where do you come off comparing yourself to William Powell? Why, Fred Allen is a better actor than you are. Who? Fred Allen. I saw him in his latest picture. It's in the bag, and the guy's terrific. And boy, does he look good on the screen. Bill, stop comparing me with Allen with those bags under his eyes and those wrinkles on his face. I won't look that bad when I'm 40. <laughs> you want to answer that, Bill? No, you take it, Livy. Quiet. Now, let me tell you something. I just finished a picture, too. The horn blows at midnight. Mary saw the preview. Go ahead, Mary. Tell him how I look. I wouldn't even tell that to another girl. <laughs> Another girl, another girl. That's telling him, Livy. What do you know about it? You didn't even see my picture. Well, I'm not talking about your picture. I merely said that Fred Allen is a better actor than you are. That's he all. is not. And, Phil, let's drop the subject or you're going to get a punch in the nose. Uh, yeah? Who's going to do it? Don Wilson. <laughs> That's who. But, Jack, I don't want to fight with Phil. Oh, you're yellow, eh? <laughs> I knew it all the time. Imagine a big guy like you. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You're the one that's yellow. Oh, yeah? Just say that once more. You're yellow. That does it. 
I'm going home. <laughs> right now. But, Jack, you can't just walk off the program. Oh, I can't, eh? Sound man, open that door. <laughs> you guys are so smart, you can run the program without me. I'm sorry, fellas. It's all had to happen in front of you, but I'm going. <laughs> Not too mad when he gets here because I'm going to ask him for the night off. Maybe if I fix him a nice, tall, frosty Tom Collins with just the right amount of. No, I'd only drink that myself. <laughs> well, well, at least one of us will be in a good mood. <laughs> Is that you, Mr. Benny? Yes. Was that you slamming the door like that? Yes, yes. Are you mad? Yes, yes, yes. Can I have the night off? Yes. I mean, no. <laughs> Roger, so what's the idea of trying to trick me? I thought I'd, I, I thought I'd slip that in while you were accentuating the positive. <laughs> well, you can forget that because you can't have tonight off. I'm going to my bedroom and lie down. I want you to come in and rub my back. Yes, sir. What do you want me to rub it with? I don't know. You got any olive oil? No, but we've got peanut butter. <laughs> Clumsy Wilson. <laughs> Never mind, Rod. Just give me a massage with your hand. Okay. Lie down, boss. Now, go ahead. Yes, sir. My, my, what big muscles in your back. Muscles? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> how, uh, how big are they, Rochester? Well... Go on. Go on. Tell me. Uh, how big would it have to be for me to get the night off? <laughs> I should have known you were leading for something. Now, you definitely can't have the night off. Those muscles are mountainous, boss. Mountainous. What? Well, uh, they've got snow on them. Uh, six months out of the year. It's too late. You had your chance, and you've rubbed me enough. Now, will you please get me a glass of ginger ale? Okay. I'll turn on the radio and see how my gang is getting along without me. I think they're so smart. And now, ladies and gentlemen, continuing with Arlie's program. With program? What are they doing with my show? Our next contestant is a charming young lady, Miss Phyllis Harrison. Phyllis Harrison? Now, Mrs. Harrison, uh, what is your occupation? I'm a house. <laughs> That's Phil Harris? I know it. Now, tell me, Mrs. Harrison, have you ever been on the radio before? Just once. I burped on breakfast at Sire. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, what they're doing to my show. Now, here's your first question, Mrs. Harris. How many people are there in the big three? Five. I knew it was Harris. I knew it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Larry Stevens, the singing star of my program, will sing this part of mine. Singing star of his Very, very good, Larry. Thank you. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wilson. Uh, yes, Larry. Well, there's somebody missing on this program, but I can't figure out who it is. He'll know who it is when he doesn't get his check. <laughs> I'm going to turn this thing off and take a nap. Still can't get over the way my gang insisted that Alan was a better actor than I am. You think at least one of them would agree with me? Hmm. I know what I'll do. I'll ask Rochester when he comes back. He's always been loyal to me. He'll give me a good. Here's your ginger ale, boss. Thanks. Rochester, if I ask you a question, will you tell me the truth? Yes, sir. Do you think Fred Allen is a better actor than I am? No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir! <laughs> well. Why, you're even better than Gary Cooper, Ronald Coleman, Spencer Tracy, and Fred McMurray all put together. Oh, Rochester, you're just trying to flatter me. No, I'm just trying to get the night off. <laughs> Well, you can't get it that way. Now, go out in the kitchen and leave me alone. I want to take a nap. Okay. Hmm. Just as bad as my cat. Oh, well, I'm going to take a nap. Maybe I'll feel better when I wake up. Oh, boy, this bed feels good. Rochester thinks he can get away with everything just because I owe him money. Uh, believe me, I'd let him go if he wasn't a partner in my penis business. <laughs> He's not much of a butler anyway. I wish I had one like you see in the movie. A real gentleman gentleman. 
The butler was class. Uh... Yes, sir. The butler, that's what I want. Suave gentleman's gentleman. Yeah. Hello, this is the residence of Jack Benny, outstanding star of the cinema, the drama, the wireless, entertains at strawberry festivals and smokers, material homey, or as gay as the occasion demands. <laughs> I'm sorry Mr. Benny is taking his part right now. This is his gentleman, Mr. Gentleman, William Powell. <laughs> who shall I say is calling? Haiti? Haiti La Who? <laughs> oh, that's... Well... I'm frightfully sorry, Miss Lamar, but Mr. Benny hasn't any more pin-up pictures of himself. He sent them all to the nurses at Tawny General Hospital. <laughs> yes, they've, uh, they just voted to hear Mr. Let's Hope We Can Find a Cure for It of 1945. <laughs> Very good. I'll tell him you called. Goodbye. William! William Powell! Coming, Master. <laughs> You called, sir? No, I called William. What you doing? I'm finished with my bath. Uh, lift me out of the tub. Yes, sir. Now, uh, dry my back. Yes, sir. Now, comb my hair. Yes, sir. There. Now, shall I put it on you, sir? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, go ahead. There you are. And I must say, you look very manly, sir. William, that goes on my head, not my chest. <laughs> now, uh, help me on with my shoes. Uh, just put them on my feet. I'll tie the laces myself. Oh, very good, sir. If you feel like roughing it. <laughs> <laughs> that I do. That I do. <laughs> the doorbell, William. <laughs> Answer. Yes, sir. Good morning, William. Oh, good morning, Miss Livingston. Come right in. Well, thank you. Your hat? Here. Your coat? Here. Your kiss? Here. Wait a minute, William. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm supposed to get that. But, sir, I'd much rather kiss her. <laughs> I didn't mean that. And anyway, look what your kid did to Mary. She fainted. She's lying on the floor. Oh, yes. She makes a tidy little heap, doesn't she? <laughs> Never mind that. Mary, Mary, speak to me. Mary, look. It's me, Jack. Say something. Get your penny back. Get your penny back. Get your penny back. Get your penny back. I didn't want any peanuts in the place. Get your penny back. 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 What a laugh. More precious fingerprints. No rest. Ha ha William, 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 where are you? Right here. You're on my lap, sir. <coughs> oh, yes. William, you're so dependable. You've been with me 68 years, haven't you? <laughs> 87, sir. Oh, yes. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to tell me the truth. You can rely upon me, sir. Tell me, William, what do you think of me as an actor? Well, sir, you're not quite as romantic as Cary Grant, and you haven't the boyish charm of Van Johnson. You uh, lack the sophistication of Charles Boyer, and you just miss the dramatic ability of Spencer Tracy. Yes, yes. Well, to sum it all up, you stink. <laughs> uh, thank you, William. I knew I could count on you. Dinner is served, sir. <laughs> Good, I'm hungry. Uh, what are we having for dinner, William? 
peanuts on the half shell. Good. Oh, William, I've been meaning to ask you, how is it that a man of your breeding has chosen to be a butler? Well, madam, I wasn't always a butler. I used to be a millionaire. In fact, until last month, I had one million dollars. And now it's gone, all gone. But how did all that money go so fast? I spent a week in Palm Springs. <laughs> Oh, we understand. Uh, come on, Mary. Let's see. Oh, say, William, I'd like a cigarette, please. Oh, just a second, but I'll get one out of Mr. Benny's musical cigarette box. Uh, just listen to it as I lift up the cover. a little out of tune. <laughs> Wait a minute, that isn't my cigarette box. Mine was solid gold studded with diamonds and rubies. There's been a robbery. There's been a robbery. I'll send for a detective. Nobody leave this room. Who are you? I'm the thin man. The thin man? You look like William, the butler. Quiet, Myrna. <laughs> Myrna! Now, where's my dog, Asta? Oh, there you are. Me? Here, Asta. Come on, come on. Stop whistling at me. I'm not a dog. I'm not a dog. I'm not a wolf. Woof, 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 woof. Oh, you poor woof. little puppy. I think you're sick. Stop feeling my nose. I'm not a dog. And cut that out. Why not? He's dangerous. He's going mad. Mad dog, mad dog, mad dog. Mad dog. I'm not a dog. I'm just as human as you are. Listen to me. Woof, 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 Wake up! Wake up! Huh? What? Oh, it's you, Rochester. I just had an awful dream. I thought so. You must have dreamt you were a dog. Me dreaming I was a dog? Don't be silly. Okay, okay. Have it your own way, but come out from under the bed. <laughs> oh, yes. How did I get down there? Well, folks, this concludes our broadcast here at Attorney General Hospital. I want to thank all you fellas for inviting us up here. I also want to take just a moment to congratulate radio station WOW in Omaha, Nebraska, on their 22nd anniversary. And next Sunday night, we'll be broadcasting from the U.S. Naval Auxiliary Air Station at 29 Palms. Oh, uh, Jack. Yes, Bill. Look, I may not see you later on, so uh, I'll take that check now that you owe me for appearing on your program. What? Uh, what did you say, Bill? I say I'll take that check you owe me for appearing on your program. Appearing on my program? What are you talking about? I dreamt that, brother. <laughs> I dreamt that. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs> now at the U.S. Naval Auxiliary Air Station at 29 Palms, the Lucky Strike Program. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from this spot on the desert that has 29 palms, we bring, we bring you a man with a spot on his head that has 29 hairs, and here he is, Jack Benny! Yes, sir, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I don't mind you reaching a little for a laugh, but you don't have to go that far. Hmm. Only 29 hairs. I'm counting the two on your chest. Oh! <laughs> Although, you know, Don, I'm kind of proud of those two hairs. I've even named them. Named them? Yep. Abercrombie and Fitch. Abercrombie is the one on the left, but Fitch has been with me a little longer. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Fitch is a hair tonic. I know, Don. In fact, if it wasn't for Fitch, I would have lost Abercrombie. <laughs> Don, this may sound silly, but they really helped me get around. Why, when I came up to the main gate this morning, the guard saluted and let me right through. The guard saluted you? Yep. As I reached the gate, my shirt blew open. He saw the two hairs on my chest and thought I was an ensign. <laughs> you don't have to laugh, fellas. You know, I used to be in the Navy. And believe me, Don, if I were still in the Navy, I'd want to be stationed right here at 29 Palms. 
Yes, sir. I don't know. There's nothing like the desert. It's so beautiful, so colorful. Lovely, so, so romantic. Every bit of it. Jack, how can you stand there with your pants full of cactus and say the desert is beautiful, colorful, and romantic? I'm merely repeating what it says on the bulletin board. Bulletin board? Yes, it says, from Lieutenant Commander Smith to the personnel at 29 Palms. You will find this desert beautiful, colorful, and romantic. That's an order. <laughs> well, you see, Don, this place is... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, fellas. Well, Mary... Here we are at 29 Palms. 30 different from the other camps we visited, isn't it? It sure is, Jack, but that's because it's so isolated. Oh, I don't think so, Mary. This place isn't so far out in the desert. It isn't, huh? Then how come when they give the boys a pass, they give them a canteen of water at the same time? A canteen of water? Yes, and if they sip it sparingly, they can make it to the main highway. Mary! Mary, stop, stop exaggerating. Exaggerating? Jack, this afternoon I was uh, taking a walk in the desert. I happened to pass two sailors. Uh Uh-huh. So one of them came over, looked at me, blinked his eyes, looked at me again, then turned to his friend and said, Hey, Steve, we must be winning. They've got these things back in production again. Those boys were just kidding you. I'll bet at least half of these fellas have seen girls before. <laughs> anyway, they were just trying to get acquainted. After all, you're the only girl here. Well, if I am, I'm not very popular. When we arrived, I was wearing my prettiest dress, and yet all the fellas flocked around Don Wilson. That's right, Jack. They hung around me for hours. Well, well why wouldn't they, Don? It's the first time they've seen so much shade in one lump. <laughs> Joe, let's be honest about it. The weather isn't bad out here at all, is it? Jack, nobody's going to punch you in the nose. It's hot and it's dry, so what, you might as well admit it. Now, Mary, it isn't hot. Oh, here comes Larry Stevens. I'll prove it to you. Say, Larry, do you think it's dry up here? Larry, it isn't so dry up here, is it? Larry, stop licking your lips and answer me. (laughs) Hmm. I feel better now, Mr. Benny. Hello. Larry, how do you like it here? This is a nice spot, isn't it? Yes, but it, isn't it strange having a naval station so far from the ocean? Well, that's not unusual, Larry. When I was a sailor in the First World War, I was stationed at Great Lake, and I went through my entire naval career without seeing either the Pacific or the Atlantic. Yeah, but at least you saw Lake Michigan. No, 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 no. I didn't see that either. But you must have seen it. The Great Lakes Naval Station is right on the shores of Lake Michigan. Mary, when I joined the Navy, I spent my first night in a hammock. When I got up, I was so bent over, I didn't see anything but the guy in back of me for the next three years. Uh, I didn't mind being bent over, but every time I sat down, I rocked myself to sleep. It was awful. But, Jack, how could you get so doubled up from sleepy? Well, Don, it was my first experience with a hammock. How did I know you weren't supposed to hang both ends on the same hook? They should give... They should give directions with those things. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Benny, it must have been terrible walking around bent over like that for three years. No, no, Larry, it worked out very well. After leaving the Navy, I went into Vaudeville as the only talking U-turn in the country. That's <laughs> what did. I knew that would hit Remley. Anyway, kid, now that you're here, I'm sure the boys would like to have a song. How about it? Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny. Yes? What is it, sailor? Is it true that when you do your show at a camp, the boys always give you a souvenir? Why, yes, yes. Once I played at an infantry camp, and they gave me a rifle. Another time, I was at an air base, and they gave me a parachute. Just two weeks ago, I played at a boot camp. And they gave him the boot. Mary. <laughs> She's just jealous because my sun suit is more daring than hers. <laughs> Thank you.
Anyway, Taylor, anyway, it's true. When I play at a camp, the boys usually get together and give me some sort of a souvenir to take home with me. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Bunny, because the boys here voted to give you something, too. Well, in fact, there are so many things we'd like to give you, you can take your choice. My choice? Yeah. You can have the desert, the palms, the wind, the sand, the rabbits, the sagebrush, the cactus. Wait a minute. The fella. heat, the dust, the gophers, the coyotes, the snakes, sailors, the ants, the dunes, the bees, the breeze. Larry, you the better The crush, the marsh, the hunt. Larry, see. The yucca, the lizard, the bunny, the wind. Yes, sir. You can beat those little pickies together now. Applause me, kids. Applause me. Applause me. Bill, you always have to be so late. What, t- what took you so long getting here? Well, I'm sorry, Jackson, but I couldn't get a lift, so I walked over from the ship's service door. Oh. <laughs> well, now, uh, now that you're here, I wish that Just you... a second, Jackson. Hold it a minute. I want to get a little sand out of my shoe. Okay. <laughs> Gee. All that sand? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll be darned. I got a gopher in there, too. A gopher? I'm afraid to take off the other shoe. I might find gravel Gertie. Well, stop. (laughs) Well, stop making up the... Oh, Jackson, I'm only kidding. I'm just kidding you. I really love it here at 28 Palms. Bill, it's not 28 palms, it's 29 palms. It's 28. 29. 28. 29. 28. 29. That's 28. You'll keep out of this. Oh. You can take my word for it, Bill. It's 29 pounds. How did they get in from New York like that? And now, wait fella. a minute, Jackson. Hold it just a minute. You know, I meant to tell you. Friday night, I saw the opening of your new picture, The Horn Blows at Midnight, at Warner Brothers Theater. Oh, yes. The Horn Blows at Midnight. How'd you like me? I don't know. I blew at 10.30. <laughs> Don't tell me you have the picture here already. <laughs> what? At 10.30. And, Phil, you don't have to make any cracks at my picture, because if I must say so myself, I give a dynamic performance. You do, eh? I certainly do. Did you read what the critics said about me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> And now, fellas, for our feature attraction tonight, we're going... And the critics said Jack Benny's performance... I know what they said. You don't have to repeat it. (laughs) And now, fellas, for our feature attraction tonight... Jack, I saw your picture, and I thought you were wonderful. Nobody's asking... (laughs) What? (laughs) What? (laughs) What? What? What did you say, Don? I said I saw your picture, and I thought you were wonderful. And now, Hey, Paul, Jackson, I want to ask you something. Uh, if you're so good in that picture, how come today it opened in Los Angeles you were hiding in Palm Springs? I wasn't hiding. You know very well I subleased William Powell's house. He's not using it for a month. What are you paying him for, Jack? Well, ordinarily, he rents it for $150 a month. But since we're such good friends, he insisted that I take it for nothing. But I told him it was ridiculous, and I gave him $10. <laughs> you know, I... I guess, I just couldn't be a stinker. <laughs> now, let's see, where was he? Ooh. Oh, yes, Mary. Oh, yeah, tonight, fellas, we're going to present a dramatic play entitled... <laughs> Excuse me, I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Hello Mr. Bennett, this is Rochester. <laughs> oh, hello, Rochester, what do you want? I thought I'd better call you, boss. Mr. William Powell was here and examined his house. And the things he said about you. Why? Why, was he mad? Mad? You know how he usually speaks in that uh, nice, quiet, subdued voice? Yes. Well, today he sounds like Donald Duck with his tail on fire. <laughs> well, Rochester, how did he happen to get so angry? Well, it worked up slowly. When he learned you were renting out rooms, he got red in the face. <laughs> then when he found out you'd start a cocktail lounge in the den, his face got purple. <laughs> Purple? Yeah, and by the time he saw the slot machines, you couldn't tell him from me. <laughs> Gee, he really must have been sore, huh? I'll say he was. Even his lawyer couldn't calm him down. 
His lawyer? Did his lawyer come out with him? No, the lawyer came out with the chief of police. You mean, you mean the chief of police was there? Yeah, he arrived shortly after the sheriff. Sheriff, chief of police. I wonder what he figures on doing. I don't know, but you couldn't be worse right now if you were Hitler in San Francisco. Rochester, well, don't worry about it. I'll straighten the whole thing out when I get home. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, Rochester, I want you to go to bed early tonight because I'm going to play golf in the morning and I want you to caddy for me. But, boss, I'm all tired out from caddying for you yesterday. Oh, stop complaining. A nine-hole course is nothing. Nothing for you, but how about me? A golf bag, 12 clubs, a basket of sandwiches, a gallon of lemonade, a first aid kit, and a parasol. For what? You don't need a caddy, you need an octopus. Oh, Rochester, you don't carry so much. I don't. Remember what happened last time I went out loaded down like that? What happened? An old prospector tied a rope around my neck and led me off into the mountains. Well, why did you go with him? I couldn't see where I was until he unloaded me. (laughs) Unloaded you? Stop making things up. Anyway, I'm going to play golf in the morning, and I want you to caddy. Okay, boss, I'll caddy for you, but tomorrow let's be sporting about it. What do you mean, sporty? If we lose the ball, let's call it fate and finish the game anyway. <laughs> All right, Roger. So then we can leave the flashlight home. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. history of that jewel of the desert, 29 Palms. Now, in this sketch, Mary, you and I play a pair of pioneers, the first settlers of 29 Palms. You're my wife, Mandy. I'm your husband, Randy. And, Larry, you're going to be my son, Sandy. That's dandy. (laughs) Now, Phil, you're going to be one of my neighbors. And, Don... Yes, Jack? You're going to be the 29 Palms. (laughs) So, uh, sit down and branch out. And now for our play, The History of 29 Palms, or I'll Be With You in Cactus Blossom Time. (laughs) Our scene opens in a little shack in the middle of the desert that's so beautiful, so colorful, so romantic. Oh, Mandy. Mandy. What is it, Randy? Have you seen Sandy? <laughs> Last time I seen him was two days ago. A couple of rabbits were chasing him. Two days ago? Why didn't he come home? I don't know. I guess they got him traced somewhere. They did it again, eh? Yep. Doggone, every time with that kid of ours out of the house, the rabbits play with him. Well, it's your own fault, Ma. I told you you should have straightened those two front teeth of his. <laughs> You're right, Paul. I knew I was going to have trouble with that kid the day he was born. What do you mean? When the doctor held him up by his ears. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here he comes now. Hop on in, son. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. Hello, Randy. Are you hungry, Sandy? A little, Mandy. Have some candy, Sandy. Well, I don't like Sandy candy. <laughs> I didn't say the candy was Sandy candy, Sandy. Did I, Mandy? No, Randy, and he well, can't have a glass of dinner. <laughs> What'd you say? I said he can't have it till after dinner. Sit down, son. Well, what do we got to eat, Ma? Well, you can have your choice. Fried yucca, mashed tumbleweed, or spaghetti and cactus balls. <laughs> As for me, Ma, spaghetti and cactus balls, but leave off the spaghetti. Okay. Hmm, who can that be? Come in. Hello, stranger. Well, howdy, howdy do. I hear to have neighbors, so I thought I'd drop in. Well, what do you know? Say more. We got a neighbor. Well, howdy, neighbor. Which house do you live in? Oh, that little white house down there, about 200 miles east. (laughs) Hey, they're really big. 
building this place up. Uh, don't worry, Ma. It's just a boom. It can't last. <laughs> Hey, neighbor, uh, uh, you making much money raising these rabbits? That's my son. <laughs> and by the way, his name is Sandy, I'm Randy, and my wife is Mandy. Sandy, Randy, and Mandy. Well, what a coincidence. Why, what's your name? It's Gerald. <laughs> That don't rhyme with anything around here. <laughs> but you know, stranger, we've been living here on this desert for nigh on to 50 years, and you're the first person ever called on us. What brings you here? Well, I'm kind of running out of water, and I thought maybe you'd let me have some. Running out of what? Water. What's that? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> now, hold on, hold on. You mean to say you ain't never here to water? No. Nope. Say, Pat, don't stand there arguing on such a hot day. Let's go take a dip in the swimming pool. A swimming pool? Say, if you folks ain't never here to water, what do you got in that pool? Sand, silly. <laughs> Sand in a swimming pool? Yep, and there's a 50-foot diving board. Hold on, stranger. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on, stranger. You can't dive in no pool filled with sand. Who can't? Go ahead, Sandy. Climb up there and show him. Okay, Paul. Now, wait a minute, Paul. He's my son as well as yours. I ain't gonna let him dive off that 50-foot board into that pool of sand like that. Don't put your bathing cap on. Don't on is nothing like mother love. <laughs> You're right up on the diving board, Paul. Okay, son, let her go. <laughs> well, anyway, Ma, we got our teeth fixed. <laughs> a long time to trick him into it. Well, neighbors, I ain't staying around this deserted place any longer. I'm going to where there's civilization, where there's life, people, bright lights, and excitement. Where's that? Yucca Valley. <laughs> Yucca Valley? Say more. That sounds like the kind of a place we ought to visit. Yucca Valley. Let's hitch up the wagon and go. A chicks and ducks and geese better hurry When I take you out in the surrey When hey, I take... Hey, Pa, Pa, don't sing that song. Why not? It ain't been written yet. <laughs> well, I wish they'd hurry. I like it. <laughs> well, we're all hitched up. Let's go. Okay, but wait just a minute. Before we start on such a long trip, we ought to have some refreshments. You got any brandy? Brandy? I don't know. Hey, Mandy, we got any brandy handy? I don't know, Randy. I'll ask Sandy. Never mind. I ain't going through that again. <laughs> now, come on. Let's get started for the big city, Yucca Valley. Okay. I hope it's cooler there. Oh, Mandy, it ain't so hot here. It ain't, eh? On the way over, I saw a tongue coming down the road with a dog hanging out. <laughs> Never mind, let's get started. Everybody in the wagon. Giddy up, giddy up. Wait a minute, hold it just a minute. Here comes somebody staggering toward us. Where? Well, there, he's a stranger. Looks like he's been lost in the desert for weeks. Yeah, look at that wild look in his eyes. So oh, stranger, stranger. At last, at last I'm here. At last, civilization, people, excitement, life. Oh, it was a long trip, but I made it. I made it. Take it easy, stranger. Where'd you come from? Yucca Valley. <laughs> Yucca Valley? Well, why did you leave there? The desert, the palms, the wind, the sand, the rabbit. Stranger. The safe, stranger, the hold on. Wait a minute. The gopher. 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 The 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 Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, let's go out to Beverly Hills to Jack Benny's house where we find our star of stage, screen, and radio relaxing in the library. Yeah. 
Gee, it's nice to have a few hours to yourself with nothing to do. I think I'll read a book. See, there's some good ones on this shelf here. Here's one. Gertrude Eichelberger, Girl Plumber. (laughs) Oh, I read that one. Gosh, it was touching. I'll never forget that part where Gertrude tenderly picked up a monkey wrench and bashed her husband's head in. (laughs) But he had it coming to him. Imagine heating his beer with her soldering iron. (laughs) Maybe there's another book I... Oh, here are some. The Rover Boys on a Marshmallow Hunt. (laughs) Nah, I'm too old for that. Elsie Dinsmore's First Petticoat. Hmm, pictures, too. (laughs) Nah, I'm too old for that. Forever Amber. Nah, I'm... Hmm. No picture. This book's on the wrong shelf there. I better put it over here. Wait a minute, there's a book missing. Oh, yes, I remember. Ronald Coleman took that one two weeks ago. Two weeks? Say, that little book is going to pay for itself in no time. (laughs) Oh, here's one I haven't read. I Never Left Home. Must be by one of those new French authors. Bob Hope. <laughs> well, I'm not in the mood now, so maybe I'll... Say, here's a book I never saw before. Let's see. My Diary by Rochester Van Jones. <laughs> oh, what do you know? It's Rochester's Diary. I think I'll take a look and see if... No, I better not. Oh, I'll just read a little bit. It can't hurt. Dear Diary... I take my pen in hand to tell you the little secrets that dwell in my heart. Isn't that cute? (laughs) Let me see. March 8th. Dear Diary, last night I went to another meeting of the Central Avenue Roll Out the Barrel and Dice Club. (laughs) I told Mr. Benny I was going to a lecture on meteorological phenomena. Hmm, a lecture on meteorological phenomena. Look how he spelled lecture. (laughs) Let's see. April 2nd, Dear Diary. Two nights ago, I dreamed that Lena Horne fell madly in love with me. Last night, I dreamed she threw her arms around my neck and kissed me. Right now, I'm drinking Ovaltine as my dreams are getting better all the time. April 5th, Dear Diary, Mr. Benny is one of the kindest, most considerate, most generous bosses I ever had. Well, and he never gets mad when I ask him for a raise. I know this because I've asked him thousands of times. (laughs) Well, I've always believed in free speech. I guess I've read enough of Rochester. Wow, look at the list of girls' names and phone numbers he's got on the last page. Flossy Brown, Jefferson, 2957. Ethel Johnson... Oh, oh, here he comes. I better jump up on the table and put his diary on the top shelf. Now, he'll never suspect that I've read... Oh, boss, what are you doing up on the table? Huh? Oh, oh. Oh, there's a mosquito in the room. A mosquito? Last time I caught you up on the table, it was a mouse. (laughs) Where did you ever see me hide from a mouse? The night you made me send for Frank (laughs) Buck. Rochester, what did you come in here for, anyway? Your violin teacher called and said it'd be a few minutes late. Oh, Professor LeBlanc. Yeah, he's going to give me a lesson today. Huh? Oh, well, if that's the case, can I have the day off? Why? I want to go to a lecture on meteorological phenomena. <laughs> Rochester, you've been there once. Well, this time I'm going to try to get even. <laughs> I 
I thought so. Well, you can't go. Okay. Then I better call my girl, Flossie Brown, and tell her I can't meet her after the lecture. Let's see. What's her phone number again? Uh, uh... Jefferson 2957. <laughs> Boss, you saw that in my diary. No, no, I didn't, Rochester. I, I guessed it. Guessed it? Yes. You know, boss, it's possible to guess Jefferson 2. And with a little effort, you can guess Jefferson 2-9. Roger. And yes. under extreme coincidental and un- un- unusual conditions, you may even guess Jefferson 295. Rochester. But when you guess Jefferson 2957, that's another meteorological phenomenon. <laughs> all right, all right, Rochester. I accidentally came across your diary. And by the way, thanks for saying all those nice things about me. You're absolutely right. I don't mind how many times you ask for a raise. You can ask me for a raise any time you want. I know, boss, I know, but repetition ain't doing for me what it's doing for LSMFT. <laughs> well, don't worry. Maybe someday you'll... Oh, that must be my music teacher. I'll get it. Hello, Jack. Oh, it's you, Mary. Come on in. Say, Jack, here's a copy of Look Magazine, and it's got your picture on the cover. Look Magazine? Let me see that. Oh, gosh, look at me. In a full-dress suit playing my violin. Say, Mary, I'd like to keep this magazine. How much does it cost? Nothing. This week they're giving them away. (laughs) They are not. There it is right on top. Ten cents. Now, look, there's a story about me inside. See, it's about my career in show business. Oh, yeah. Oh, for heaven's sake, look at this misprint. It says I play the Orpheum Theater here in 1867. (laughs) Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, it was the Pantages. Now, look, here's a picture taken when I was in the third grade. That's me in the corner. I should have known. Look at that dunce cap on you. Mary, that's not a dunce cap. I had a very high forehead. (laughs) Dunce cap. Well, if that's your head, you must have got your hair cut with a pencil sharpener. Pencil sharpener, pencil sharpener. You know, that's a very nice picture of me on the cover. Oh, Rochester. Yes, boss? Take this magazine out and pin it on the bulletin board in front of the house. Yes, sir. Shall I put it above or below the reviews on The Horn Blows at Midnight? (laughs) Put it right next to them. And while you're out there, throw those rocks back off the lawn. (laughs) Jealous bunch of actors there. Oh, uh, Mr. Benny, I meant to tell you, your music teacher, Professor LeBlanc, is waiting for you in the den. Professor LeBlanc? I didn't hear him come in. Say, Jack, is that the same violin teacher you had last year? No, no, Mary. He gave me three lessons and was drafted. Boss, he gave you three lessons and enlisted. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, Mary. I got to go in the den and take my violin lesson. See you later. Yeah, da 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 dum da dum da dum That's funny. Told me he was drafted. I never could understand that. That was Larry Stevens singing Sleigh Ride in July. And now back to Jack Benny's house where we find Jack taking violin lessons. (laughs) No, no, Monsieur Benny, no. Did I do something wrong, Professor? No, no, Monsieur Benny. Perhaps it is my fault. But uh, do you mind if I tell you something? No, no, of course not. After all, you're the teacher and you... (laughs) probably know more about the violin than I do. Thank you. <laughs> now, Monsieur Benny, you are holding in your hand a very delicate instrument. Uh-huh. The music from the violin is like the singing of the angels, like the murmur of the breeze, like the rippling of the brook. Now, play. <laughs> It does sound like that, doesn't it? Mr. Benny, perhaps if you held the violin upside down. (laughs) But, Professor, I can't play that way. Let's try anything. (laughs) But, Professor, I don't think I'm good enough to do tricks yet. (laughs) Very well. We will try it again. And this time, I will help you. I will count off. Okay. Ready? One, two. Raise your little finger higher. Keep your nose up off the G string. 
a little softer while you're learning. Not so loud, my stomach's turning. <laughs> Your boso strokes are littler They should make you play for Hitler Miss <laughs> <laughs> Aubigny, hmm. Miss Aubigny The violin is an instrument that is supposed to soothe you To calm you To make you relax To settle your nerves The singing of the angels professor. The murmuring of the breeze The rippling of the brook Professor, professor uh, Forgive me, Miss Aubigny I lost my temper. Oh. I wish it was my hearing. <laughs> what? Never mind, never mind. We'll proceed with the next lesson. Intermezzo. Intermezzo. That's what I like, that classical stuff. <laughs> proceed, please. Thank you. Oh, no, Mr. Benny, you must not go. <laughs> you must go. <laughs> oh, oh, I see what you mean. Diddle 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 diddle. Is that what you want, Mr. Benny? You must diddle on your fiddle. <laughs> Oh, oh. Uh, si, si, senor. Si, si. Hiya, Jackson, what are you doing with that? Oh, no, 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 it's spring, Jackson. The little birdies can't take that. <laughs> Bill, stop butting in. I'm taking a violin lesson. Well, who's the character with the silly mustache? Oh. Bill, please. I am Professor André Leblanc, Michel Benny's music teacher. Hi, Andy. What do you hear from Petrilla? <laughs> Professor, this is Phil Harris, my orchestra leader. Ah, oh, fellow artist. I greet you. Mm, mm. <laughs> Funny you didn't do that when I came in. <laughs> well, it's just a French greeting, Jackson. They do that all the time. Oh, well, Phil, sit down while I finish my lesson, will you? Okay. Now, Mr. Benny, continue with intermezzo. <laughs> Mr. Benny, Mr. Benny, you are playing much too loud. Can't you play a little softer? Do you have a mute? No, but I can put a glove on my left hand. <laughs> Why don't you throw a wet towel over the string? Now, Phil. Please, 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 Mr. Harris. I am trying to teach Mr. Benny something. And you are driving me nuts, too. You said, now be quiet, Phil, will you? <laughs> Holy smoke, to think a cat had to die for this. <laughs> Now what? There was a phone call for you. For me? Yeah, it was a complaint that you're playing too loud and it's very disturbing. Who phoned? One of the neighbors? No, the San Francisco conference. <laughs> Stop making things up. I'm sorry, Professor. Well, never mind. For today, the lesson is over. Through. Finish. Kaput. <laughs> I will see you next week. Oh. Well, okay, Professor, but tell me, do you think you can make a great violinist out of me? Well, I think I can do something for you. But it will take time. How old are you? Why? How much time have we got left? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Professor. <laughs> I... <laughs> I know you're a great teacher, but if you don't like the way I play the violin, why did you take the job? I am working for that Yankee dollar. <laughs> Oh. Well, you ain't gonna get it around here. <laughs> Roger, so you keep out of this. Well, I'll see you next week, Professor. Goodbye. Goodbye, Monsieur Benny. Twenty-four years, and all he knows is la 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 la. Hey, if I wasn't so hungry, I wouldn't come back. <laughs>
Now, Phil, please go in the other room with Mary, will you? I want to practice a little more. Say, Jackson, what's come over you all of a sudden? Practicing the violin and taking lessons and everything? Nothing, nothing. I just want to get rusty, that's all. Oh, no, you got something up your sleeve. Now, what is it? I have nothing up my sleeve. Now, get out of here and let me practice or I'll put you out. You put me out? Yes. Let's see you do it. Okay, Jackson, I'll go. I'll go quiet. Oh, my goodness, look what time it is. Hey, kids, kids, I gotta be leaving. I've got an appointment. Where are you going, Jack? Oh, just out for a little walk. I'll be back. I knew you had something up your sleeve. I haven't got anything up my sleeve. Can a man have an appointment? I gotta run along. I'll see you later. Well, what are you taking your violin with you for? I'm taking it by the music store to have it fixed. Now, so long, fellas. I'll see you later. Say. Say, Phil, it's, it's been quite a while. I, I wonder where he went. Well, I don't know, Don, I'm sure. And he took his violin with him. Do you believe what he said about taking it by the music store to have it fixed? Now, the way he plays that thing, how could he tell if it was busted? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe he had an appointment with his dentist. No, he could have sent those. Yeah. (laughs) That is good. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait till he gets home. Yeah, would you like to play some gin rummy, Mary? No, I don't think so. I'm a little tired of gin. How'd you like to shoot little crabs, kid? <laughs> oh, don't be silly, Phil. Let's listen to the radio. Okay, I'll turn it on. And now, ladies, once again, I bring you the latest news on rationing. On August 1st, a new shoe stamp becomes valid. Uh, this stamp should not be confused with stamps X, Y, and G, which become valid August 5th, whereas the new shoe stamp becomes valid August 1st which is two days after stamps M, L, and O expire. (laughs) This leaves you stamps H, I, and W, which are blue, and are not to be confused with the red stamps, which are Q, R, and J. (laughs) These stamps are to be used to buy, but then your grocer doesn't have any, and they will no doubt expire before he gets some. However, your red stamps, which are called meat stamps, should be used to purchase butter in limited quantities, unless you prefer margarine, in which case you use stamps C, H, and E, which become valid after A, D, and Y become void before F, T, and H become valid. (laughs) Now, ladies, if you have copied this information down and understand it, please send it to me as I am all balled up. Address your letters to all balled up in care of the station to which you are listening. Oh, get something else, Phil. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, are you a Los Angeles pedestrian? Are you suffering from bumper fatigue? Does your head ring? And when you answer it, is it a wrong number? It is? Then you've got static in your attic. So why not try sympathy soothing? (laughs) And here's good news for people who can't sleep. Just mix two drops of sympathy soothing syrup with one quart of gin. (laughs) Drink down this pleasant mixture, and when you go to bed, pull the cork up over you. (laughs) But remember, use only sympathy soothing syrup. Sympathy spelled backwards is Yatapamis. Y H T A P M Y S. Yatapamis, 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 ride your blues away. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a few weeks ago we got a letter from a man who was greatly helped by sympathy soothing syrup. And we have asked that man to come here tonight and tell you his own story. Now, what is your name, sir? Jack Benny. (laughs) Phil, Phil, did you hear that? Yeah, so that's where he went, huh? And Mr. Benny, what is your profession? I'm a violinist. And it just happens that I brought along my violin, and I'd like to... Now, Mr. Benny, how long ago did you start taking our product? About six months ago. And at that time, I was very weak and run down. In fact, I used to get tired out from brushing my teeth. (laughs) But after using three bottles of your sympathy soothing syrup... I can now brush my teeth without changing hands. <laughs> and now, I'd like to play my Ladies 
Ladies and gentlemen, six months ago, this man was an emaciated, dried-up little weakling. Look. A sickly, scrawny nincompoop. Look, I wasn't A anything... hollow shell without ambition or courage. A spineless little jerk. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I wish you could see him now, standing here straight and tall. The bloom of health in his cheeks. And his body bulging with muscles. Me? <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, this man who six months ago was a sickly, scrawny... That's little... enough already! <laughs> Please let me play Mr. my Mr. Benny, we want to thank you for coming up here tonight and hope you will continue to enjoy such excellent health. Thank you, Mr. Sympathy. Now, I have a little selection that, that I'd like... That concludes the interview. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, a word on behalf of my... Tonight, folks, I'm going to play... Get away from that microphone! <laughs> Very short number. Will I you please to... stop? I have a commercial to do. But you told me if I came up here, I could play. I did not. Now, here, take this bottle of Zim, put these soothing syrup, and go. You promised me the larks. Huh. I promised you nothing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you suffer from. Get away from that microphone! Ladies and gentlemen, do you suffer from goofy eyelids? Do you wheeze? You have stripes in your pipe? You do? Then why not try some Zim for the soothing syrup? Remember, Zim for the smell backwards is your daffodil! Hey, kids, I'm back. Where were you, Jack? Yeah, Jackson, what was the big secret? Well, if you must know, I made a guest appearance on a very high-class program. You did? Yes, and kids, I want to tell you that I was absolutely a sensation. I played a violin solo. They made me take four encores. Imagine four encores. Jack. What? We heard that program. Oh. Wasn't it lousy? Good night, <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jack Benny Program, starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Well, let's go out to Jack Benny's house where we find Jack and Rochester cleaning out the swimming pool. <laughs> Now, boss. Yeah. Gosh, this pool sure can get dirty in a few months. Maybe it would keep cleaner if it had a little if it had a tile bottom. Well, I... Or even a cement bottom. Well, I... In fact, any kind of bottom would be better than this Mississippi mud. Well, I would cement it, but I'm growing rice in the shallow end. <laughs> now come on, let's start cleaning the pool. We'll begin down at the deep end. Okay. Watch your step going down the sloping part. Because it's still wet and slippery. <laughs> Ooh. Congratulations, boss. 18 inches further than last year. Rochester, help me up. Okay. Now, Rochester, pick up that stick and clean out the drain. What stick? That one up there on the edge of the pool. Boss, put on your glasses. That's the diving board. Oh. Oh. Anyway, let's get on with the scrubbing. Okay. I'll go to the house and get a bucket full of water. You don't have to go to the house for water. Just turn that handle up there. But, boss, that's the one that fills the pool. Don't worry. You turn the handle, and I'll hold this bucket under the pipe. But, boss, that'll be... Tut, tut, tut. Now go ahead and turn the handle. I've got the bucket. Okay. Ready? Yes. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off! (laughs) Rochester. Rochester, I'm drowning. Everything's gone black. You ain't drowning, boss. You got the bucket over your head. Don't stand there saluting me. Take that bucket off my head. Okay. Come on now. Let's try to get... Now, look at that frog over there in the corner of the pool. Isn't he cute? Yeah, he's sure big, too. Hey, Rochester, help me catch him. He's like a nice pet. I'd like to keep him. <laughs> Doggone anything that's green you like to see. <laughs> Hurry, he's hopping away. All right, all right, all right, all right. Now I've got him cornered. All right, all right. Rochester, where did he go? Where is he? Put the bucket on your head. You got him trapped. On my head. Get him off. Get him off. Quick. Hold still. I'll get him. Rochester, put down that broom. For heaven's sake, you could hurt me with that. 
Hello, Jack. What's all the excitement? Roger, so the next time you... Boss, boss, Miss Lewis is here. Tip your frog. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mary. Right, 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 right. Oh, darn it, he got away. And I wanted to keep him. Oh, Jack, you've already got a turtle, a lizard, a garter snake, two crickets, and a caterpillar. What do you want all those things for? Well, Mary, it's no fun coming home at night to an empty house. <laughs> you know. That reminds me of the first time we met. Huh? When you leaned over and whispered in my ear, come up to my apartment, babe, and I'll show you my insects. <laughs> I was a sly one, wasn't I? Eh? Some sly one, the way you chased me around the room with a butterfly net. Oh, that was years ago. I've got a lasso now. <laughs> Say, Mary, how do you like the way I'm fixing up my backyard? Oh, it's swell, Jack. And you know, Mary, as soon as the pool is filled, I want you to come over and swim every day. Oh, I'd like to, Jack, but I'm putting all my money into war bonds. All right, all right, but I don't charge anything for the shower. No, but the price of towels is outrageous. <laughs> Rochester. Rochester's right. You charge for everything. Five cents for a sun chair, seven cents for a beach umbrella, ten cents for water wings. Mary. You've even got a meter on the diving board. Now, Mary. Why, last year you made more money out of your swimming pool than you did in radio. Well, it was a very hot summer. <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You've got the only swimming pool that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> Stock exchange, stock exchange. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Miss Livingston. Oh, hello, Larry. Hiya, kid. Say, Larry, I've got good news for you. I'm fixing up my pool, and anytime you feel like swimming, come on over here. Gee, thanks, Mr. Benny, but I can't swim. Well, you can go waiting. Sure, and up to your neck, it's only 15 cents. <laughs> yeah, I lose money on Gary Cooper. <laughs> Say, Larry, I thought you'd be down at the studio rehearsing your song for the program. Oh, I did that this morning. Would you like to hear it, Mr. Benny? Sure, sure. Go ahead, kid. I wonder how tall he is, anyway. <laughs> that was very good, Larry. Now, if you want to stick around, you can help me fix Hiya, up the... Jackson. Hello, Libby. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Phil. Hello, Mr. Harris. Hiya, kid. How's the red-headed Sinatra today? <laughs> well, cleaning out the old pool. Getting ready for business again, huh, Jackson? Yep. Say, Phil, would you like your job back again this summer as lifeguard? No, not after what happened last year. What happened, Phil? Every time somebody yelled for help before I could save them, I had to buy a ticket to get in the pool. <laughs> I'm sorry, Phil, but I can't afford to pay you a lifeguard salary and let you swim for nothing. And anyway... Rochester, what are you doing? I'm testing the diving board. <laughs> good, good. Now, will you go in the house and call the printer? Tell him we want the tickets for Wednesday. Yes, sir. Shall I tell him that this year we're going to pay him, or is he going to have to swim it out again? <laughs> Well, leave it up to him. Yes, sir. By the way, Phil, uh, what did you come over here for? Well, Jackson, I dropped by to ask you to do me a big favor. A favor? Yeah, you know the nightclub I'm running. Oh, yes, yes, yes. How's it going? Fine, and Jackson, tonight is celebrity night. Oh, celebrity night, eh? Yeah, and, uh, well, I don't want to impose on you, but if you aren't doing anything, I thought that, well, I thought that maybe you could come over certainly, and... Certainly, then... Phil, certainly. I'll be glad to. What shall I wear? An apron. We're sure to help. <laughs> Look, Phil, if you think hey, that I... Phil, who celebrities Jack's gonna wait on? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure who's gonna show up, but this afternoon I got on the phone, I called up Ronald Coleman, Spencer Tracy, Clark Gable, Van Johnson, Mark Twain, Bing Crosby, and... Wait a uh... minute, Phil. What, you called Mark Twain? Yeah. Phil, Mark Twain's been dead over 30 years. Well, how do you like that? I must have had an old phone book. <laughs> Look, Phil, how long have you been having these celebrity nights? Oh, I started last week, Jackson. I had a swell turnout, too. Charlie McCarthy was there. You mean Charlie and Edgar Bergen? No, no. Edgar was out of town, so Charlie came alone. What? And you want to know something? Jackson, he ain't so much. He sat there all evening and never opened his mouth. <laughs> well, for heaven's sake, Charlie McCarthy is a dummy. Look, Jackson, as long as they pay their check, I don't pry into their private affairs. <laughs> Thanks, Phil, but I don't think I want to come over to your club tonight. Boss, boss! What is it, Rochester? There's a gentleman here to see you, a Mr. Kearns. Oh, Mr. Kearns, the newspaper man. I'll be right in. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Kearns. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, Mr. Benny. And I want to tell you that my editor was very pleased with that last story you gave me. Oh, you mean the one about how I found Phil Harris? Mm-hmm. 
It was as interesting as the stories on how you found Mary Livingston and your butler, Rochester. Oh, yeah, I found Mr. Harris in Vermont. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and now I, uh, I want to do an article about... Right Tom between Wilson. Vermouth and Vermont. You know, <laughs> I said, Ron I want to... there. <laughs> Pardon me, what did you say? I when... said, I want to do an article about Don Wilson. Uh, tell me, uh, how did you come to select Don as your announcer? Don Wilson? Well, I'll tell you. The very first time I heard Don speak... I was impressed with his voice and delivery. Oh, I see. And you thought he'd be good doing commercials, huh? Anyway, I knew from the start that Don had a very good voice for radio. And you've been proven right, Mr. Benny. You know, I've heard lots of people comment about his voice, his pronunciation, and his pear-shaped tones. Yes, Don is the only announcer in radio with pear-shaped tones and a body to match. <laughs> it works out swell. Well, tell me, Mr. Benny, uh, how did you discover Don Wilson? Well, I found Don shortly after I started in radio. In fact, I was on for my second sponsor, the International Corset Company. Did you hear my program then? No, but my mother told me about them. Oh. <laughs> well, the way it happened was this. Uh, one day I got a call from my sponsor, asked me to come down to his office. Uh -huh. He said he wanted to talk to me. So I got into a taxi, picked up Mary and Phil. You see, they were with me at the time. And the three of us drove over to my sponsor's office. <laughs> Jack, your sponsor really has a nice building here. And he certainly believes in advertising. Yeah, look at that big neon sign. The International Corset Company. We cover the globe. <laughs> well, there's no use standing out here. Let's, uh... <whistles> Phil, get away from those windows. <laughs> Come on. There it is. Uh, I beg your pardon, miss. Uh, would you tell Mr. Willoughby that Jack Benny is here to see him? Well, Mr. Willoughby's expecting you, Mr. Benny. Go right through that door. Thank you. Just follow me, kid. Yes? Uh, uh, Mr. Willoughby, please. Oh, you're Mr. Benny. Mr. Willoughby's expecting you. Go right through that door. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, kid. Yes? Hmm. <laughs> I'm here to see Mr. Willoughby. Oh, you're Jack Benny. Yes. Mr. Willoughby's expecting you to go right through that door. <laughs> Thank you. Come on, kid. Yes? Miss, I'm Jack Benny. Mr. Willoughby's expecting me. Who's Mr. Willoughby? <laughs> Look, miss, isn't this the International Corset Company? Yes. Well, Mr. Willoughby is the president. Oh, you mean Snoogie. <laughs> Snoogie? Yes. Go right through that door. Oh, for, well, all right. Come on, kid. Mr. Willoughby? Yes. Surprise? <laughs> Mr. Willoughby, I'm Jack Benny. Oh, yes, yes. Come right in. I've got Mary and Phil with me. Oh, splendid, splendid. Hello, Mr. Willoughby. Hiya, bub. What do you hear from the hips? <laughs> Phil. Now, Mr. Willoughby, what is it you wanted to see me about? Well, frankly, Jack, since you've been broadcasting for us, our company is losing money. Losing money? But last week you said you had more orders than you can fill. I said we had more corsets than we can fill. <laughs> oh, We've been selling corsets for 15 years, and this is the first time the company is feeling the pinch. Oh. oh, well, Mr. Willoughby, if people don't buy your product, what has my radio program got to do with it? Now, look, Jack, we're paying you enough money. Why don't you stop reading the commercials and hire a good announcer? Well, Mr. Willoughby, if you don't like the way I read the commercials, Phil Harris can do them. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. Here, Phil, read this commercial I dreamed up last night. Now, get this, Mr. Willoughby. The show opens with a big fanfare. Then we go into our theme song, dedicated to the modern miss who wears an international corset. Then as the music of the theme song fades down, Phil steps up to the microphone and says... This program is sponsored by the International Corset Company. We don't guarantee to take it off you, but uh, we can pack it in so nobody will notice. <laughs> And uh, you 
you'll just love the new slogan, Gather Unto You What Is Yours. <laughs> and then we also... Well, wait a minute, Jack. Wait a minute. Those are the commercials I'm talking about. Now, look, Mr. Willoughby, you can't blame my program if you're losing money. There must be something wrong with the product. Something wrong with the international corset? Are you crazy? Mr. Willoughby, I own. I said... know what you said. But, look... Have you ever heard of the woman in the window? Yes. Well, before using our product, she couldn't even get in the house. <laughs> hey, Mr. Willoughby, you asked for it. I received hundreds of complaints about your corset. Complaints? Yes. The steel you use in the stays is defective. When someone wearing your corset bends over, the stays have a tendency to snap loose with a ping. <laughs> with a ping? Yes. I can't believe it. It's it's incredible. Why, it's... Wait a minute. My secretary wears an international corset. I'll buzz for it. When she comes in, I'll ask her to bend down. And if the international corset is what you... What is it, Snoochie? Hmm. <laughs> Ethel, uh, would you mind picking up that pin on the rug? What? Ethel, would you mind bending over as though you're picking something up? Oh, certainly. <laughs> there. Did you hear that, Mr. Willoughby? Ping! No. No, it can't be. I, I don't believe it. Uh, would you mind bending over again, Ethel? Certainly. <laughs> there. That's the first time I ever heard Ethel ping. <laughs> Mary. All right, you win, Jack. You win. But I'll give you a proposition. I'll put better steel in my corsets if you'll get a good announcer to do the commercial. Okay, Mr. Willoughby, it's a deal. Come on, Mary. Come on, Phil. Let's go. Well, what are you going to do, Jack? Yeah, where are you going to find an announcer? I don't know where I'm going to find one, but I know what I want. I want someone with a voice that's different. A voice that has dignity, charm. And I won't stop looking until I find one. I'll find an announcer if it takes me ten years. And uh, that's how you found Don Wilson? It wasn't that easy, Mr. Kearns. I tried voices, voices, deep ones, high ones, soft ones, long ones. All right, you're next. Read this. The International Corset Company presents Jack Benny. Now the show opens, and you say, The International Corset Company presents Jack and the Jack and the Never mind, never mind. All right, bud, you try it. The show opens, and you say, The International Corset Company presents Jack Benny. Now cut that out. And you won't do it. All right, fella, you're next. Read this. The show opens and you say... The internet... The internet... The international course... Of, course of, presents... Jack... 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 Jack, you've auditioned over 500 people. Yeah, where are you taking us now? I said I was going to find an announcer, and I will. We're going right in here. Hey, Libby, look what it says on the door. The Acme Elocution School. Oh, yeah. We can train your vocal so you won't sound like a yokel. <laughs> Come on, let's go in. A with a U is... A-U-A-U. D with a U is... D-U-D-U. U-D-U-D-U-A-U-A. G with a U is... G-U-D-U. E with a U is... A-U-E-U-G-U-D-U. Very good, students. Very good. Hey. Hey, Mary. Mary, what do you think? P with a U is P-U-P-U. Why? Please, please, what's all this disturbance over here? Oh, I'm sorry if we're intruding, but I'm Jack Benny. I'm looking for a radio announcer. Well, you've come to the right place. Now, let's see. In this class, I have little Harry Von Zell, Billy Goodwin, Jimmy Wellington, and that fat boy over there is Donald Wilson. Donald Wilson? Say, I like that name, and he looks like he might be just right for my program. Certainly, Mr. Benny. I'll call him over. Oh, Donald? Donald, this is Jack Benny. How do you do? How with an H and an O and a U and an O and a D is a how do do. <laughs> what? E. Hi. Give me a piece of pie. E. Hi. Bill. Cut that out. E. Vermont. <laughs> hey, 
Gee, I knew Vermont ahead of time, because this is 12 years ago. Now, Mr. Wilson, I'm considering you as an announcer for my program. And if you take the job, I hope everything turns out fine. I'm sure with an S and a U and an I with an S-U-U-S-U-U-I-L. Huh? He said, I'm sure it will. Oh, oh. <laughs> now, Donald, class is over, and you can speak naturally. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and Mr. Benny, I also want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity because I understand there's a lot of money to be made in radio. Not unless you own a swimming pool. <laughs> what? P with an O and an O-O-L with an O-O-P and an O-P-A. <laughs> Mary, stop it. Now, Mr. Wilson, before we sign the contract, I want to hear you read this simple line. The International Corset Company presents Jack Benny. Yes, sir. The International Corset Company presents the greatest comedian in the world. Huh? That inimitable, that incomparable, that handsome master of ceremony. Mary, this guy's going to be great. The greatest personality in show business today, that scintillating star, that virtuoso of the violin. You don't have to go any further, Bob. You got the job. Please, Bill, please. I want to hear him. That sparkling wit of the airways, that lovable, laughable favorite of millions, Jack Benny. <laughs> And that, Mr. Kearns, is how I found Don Wilson. And he did his first announcing job while I was still working for the International Corset Company. Well, that's a very interesting story, Mr. Benny. And I've been making notes so I could... Oh, darn it, I dropped my pencil. Oh, yes, yes, I'll pick it up for you. (laughs) Hmm. Why, Mr. Benny, do you wear a... Never mind, the interview is over. Goodbye. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, last Tuesday was V.E. Day. But as President Truman said, we still have a problem, and here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, the president, didn't mean me. He meant Japan. Japan, that little body of land surrounded by mimics. (laughs) <laughs> but getting back to V.E. Day, this certainly has been an historic week, hasn't it, Don? Oh, it certainly has. And Jack, when you were overseas, I'll bet you had no idea the Germans would surrender when they did. Would, uh, would you mind repeating that, Don? I said when you were overseas, I'll bet you had no idea the Germans would surrender when they did. Don, are you kidding? <laughs> what? Look, now that it can be told... Let me tell you something. Now, wait a minute, Jack. You're not going to tell me that you planned the invasion. Oh, you know. (laughs) And we try to keep it a secret. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Jack. You only went overseas to entertain the boys. (laughs) You fell for that, too, huh? (laughs) I didn't fall for anything. If you didn't go overseas to entertain the boys, why did you go? Don, when Churchill comes over here and hands you a note from Eisenhower, you can't say no. (laughs) So let's not... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hi, everybody. Say, you're pretty happy tonight. (laughs) You're pretty happy tonight, aren't you, Mary? Well, why shouldn't I be? Even though we still have work to do, at least the fighting in Europe is over. That's right. And, Mary, you want to know something... Jack's taking credit for the whole thing. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack. What do you know about military affairs? Listen, sister, I was in the Navy during the last war, and if I must say so myself, I was a darn good sailor. Some sailor. That was 27 years ago, and you still haven't got your 85 points. (laughs) Mary, don't be funny. I helped make naval history. Oh, sure, sure. Sure. The first day you joined, you got on a boat, tried to salute an officer, stuck your thumb in your eye, couldn't see where you're going, stepped off the side of the ship. Mary. Your suspenders caught on a nail, and if they hadn't stuck a paintbrush in your hand, you'd have been (laughs) non-essential. All right, all right. Anyway, Don was talking about what I did in this war. That's right, Mary, and Jack claims that he went overseas because Eisenhower sent for him. 
Eisenhower sent for you? <laughs> well, <laughs> not only that, Mary. Jack said Churchill came over here and handed him the note. Churchill handed you a... Jack, Benny, if you weren't wearing glasses, I'd punch you right in the nose. <laughs> oh, put him back on and stop showing off. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary, but it's, it's little things like that that bring out the Errol Flynn in me. <laughs> So watch it, kid. <laughs> well, it's your own fault for making up things that aren't true. Churchill handing you a note. I didn't say he actually handed me the note. He came over to my house. I wasn't home, so he walked around to the back porch and stuck it in a milk bottle. <laughs> so naturally, I just... Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? You may not remember me after all these years, but I was in the Navy the same time you were. At Great Lake? Yes, sir. The name is Flanagan. Oh, Flanagan? Seaman third class. Oh. Well, look, uh, <laughs> Flanagan, why don't you sit down and after the show we'll have a bite and talk over old times. Yes, sir. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, Benny, remember the first day you joined the Navy? You got on a ship, saluted an officer, stuck your thumb in your they eye. They know about that. They know about it. <laughs> I'll never forget you hanging there by your suspenders. Ha, ha, ha. They called you Benny the Human Yo-Yo. <laughs> Look, look, Flanagan. Remember the time you had a watch tattooed on your wrist so you wouldn't have to buy one? <laughs> never mind. Then you tried to get your money back because it wouldn't run? <laughs> Flanagan, never mind my tattoo. Now go sit down. Yes, sir. Those were the days. <laughs> hmm. Now where was I? On the back porch with a milk bottle. Oh, yeah. So I read the note from Eisenhower, packed as fast as I could, grabbed the first plane, and when I arrived overseas, who do you think I met? The milkman, he read the note first. <laughs> well, if you're not going to believe anything I say, there's no use letting you in. Hello, I'm... Mr. Benny. What are you mad about? Oh, nothing, Larry. It's just that I've been telling Mary and Don about my military accomplishments, and they don't believe me. Oh. Well, why don't you tell it to me, Mr. Benny? I'll believe you. You will, kid? Sure, it's in my contract. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. Well, come here, kid. <clears throat> You see, Larry, when I was overseas, I perfected a new system for dive bombing. You did? Yes, and to demonstrate my system, I took a bomber up 5,000 feet, put her into a dive, You and... flew a dive bomber? Certainly. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You're the only man I know who blacks out on a merry-go-round. <laughs> that only happened once. I was reaching for the brass ring and the buckle broke on my safety belt. <laughs> Anyway, Larry, I'll tell you more about it later. Let's have your song now. Okay. Hey, Benny. Now what? Remember the time you stuck your head out of a porthole and you couldn't get it back in? Flanagan, ah, look at... Ah, ah, for two weeks, we had to stand on the dock and throw food at you. <laughs> Cut that out. Larry, go ahead and sing. Hmm, throwing food at me. They could at least open the eggs, you know. <laughs> that was just a prayer away. Just a prayer away sung by Larry Stevens. Very good, Larry. And now, kid, as I started to tell you, after I perfected the dive bomber, I came Hiya, back... Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Livy. You clowns getting any laughs? <laughs> oh, hello, Phil. Uh, what do you hear from Vermouth, Vermont? Huh? All right, all right, Jackson. So I made a mistake last week. That can happen to anybody. I know, but it was written right in the script. French Vermouth. And you called it French Vermont. All right, I'm sorry. Don't you know the difference between vermouth and Vermont? No, I never drank any Vermont. <laughs> you must have been drinking something. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You ain't going to hang that on me. I've been on the wagon for three months, and I haven't touched a drop. Well, congratulations. For three months, you haven't had a single... Say, Phil, this is the first time I ever noticed it. You've got blue eyes. <laughs> Don, Mary, look. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Livy, give me a mirror. I want to see two. <laughs> Phil, you can take our word for it. You're very pretty. <laughs> Say, Phil, how's your nightclub doing now that the curfew's been lifted? Oh, swell, Livy, swell. You know, they lifted the ban on racing, too. That, way, that won't make no difference to me, Jackson. We never serve many horses anyway. <laughs> well, it may not make any difference to you, but Crosby is very happy about it. He can race his horses again. Yeah, now that the curfew's lifted, they won't have to come in by midnight. <laughs> Kids, I don't want to change the subject, but you know, next Sunday we're broadcasting from San Francisco. And we're leaving tonight, so I want you all to... I'll take it. Hello? Long distance? 
Just a minute. Mary, it's for you. Plainfield, New Jersey. Oh, it must be Mama. Yeah. Hello? Hello, Mama. I was going to call you right after the show. Happy Mother's Day. It's good to hear your voice, too. Where's Papa? He's in the refrigerator reading a newspaper. What? Oh, all the other lights are burned out. <laughs> what a family. How's your sister, Babe? I'll find out. Say, Mama, how's Babe? Oh, for heaven's sake, when? What happened, Mary? She got her nose caught in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I knew she could do it. <laughs> What's that, Mama? You couldn't remove the vacuum cleaner, so you sent for the head of the FBI? But, Mama, it's a different Hoover that makes those. I wonder how she breathes with that vacuum cleaner on her nose. Mama, how can Babe breathe with her nose stuck in the vacuum cleaner? Oh, you keep it running. <laughs> Look, Mary, we're doing a program. Mama, I've got to hang up now, so I'll write you along. What's that, Mama? Mary, please. Cousin Bobby got out of the Army under the new system? Well. <laughs> oh, Mama. <laughs> what is it, Mary? Mama said Bobby's been overseas so long, he was discharged and had enough points left over to buy a ham. <laughs> Your mother's a car. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mama, and happy Mother's Day. You know, Mary, I like your mother. In fact, today we should all pay tribute to the one person to whom we owe so much. As for myself, I can say, all that I am today, I owe to my mother. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You ain't going to blame any sweet little old lady on that. <laughs> Phil, just take your vermouth and go back to Vermont. Now, kids, as I started to say before... Hey, Benny, when are you going to get to that clever stuff? What? You know, that part where you go... La, da, da. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't do that. You're talking about the commercials. Yeah, that's the stuff I like. <laughs> the way those guys rush out and say, Why, sure, yes, sir, you bet. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the job. <laughs> wait a minute. And, and that train cricket you got. Cricket? Yeah, the one that goes tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. See, I always thought a man did that. When are you going to get to that? That comes later at the end of the show. Well, hurry up. Get through with your stuff, will you? You're holding things down. All right, all right, Flanagan. Sit down. Now, kids, as I started to tell you, we're all meeting tonight at the station a half hour before our train leaves. I got to run home now because I got some last minute packing to do. What time is it now, Jack? I don't know. My tattoo isn't running. I mean, my watch isn't running. <laughs> Now, Phil, you and the rest of the gang finish the program and see that nobody misses the train. Okay, Jackson. So long, kids. See you later. <laughs> Rochester, I'm late and I've got to hurry. Come on and help me, will you? I've already started packing for you, boys. Oh, swell. How far have you gotten? Well, I packed your iron capsules, scotch emulsion, cod liver oil, yeast tablets, aspirin, sleeping pills, benzodrine, hair tonic, blood tonic, nerve tonic. Now let's get the eye drops, nose drops, ear drops, cough drops. Now let's get all the corn this. pads, bunion pads, heating pads, salt to shoulder pads. Now let's vitamins get... A, B, C, D, and L, S, M, F, T. Good. Boys, if you really need all this stuff, you better not go. <laughs> I'm going anyway. Now pack my shirts while I go in the bathroom and get the rest of my toilet articles. Let's see, toothpaste, toothbrush, shaving cream, razor, razor, hmm, let me see. Oh, Rochester, when did I put a new blade in my razor? A uh, new blade? Let me think, boss. Let me think. Oh, yeah, I remember. It was D-Day plus six. <laughs> oh, then this blade is still good. <laughs> but... I'll take along a new one. Sometimes they break. <laughs> now, let's see. Shaving brush, face lotion, powder, gargle, throat spray, sympathy soothing syrup. <laughs> hmm. Yes, yes, you tap a mess. Yes, yes, you tap a mess. Yes, yes, you tap a now, getting away from it, that's Cole Porter, right? Beautiful lyrics. 
Well, I guess I got everything. How are you doing, Rochester? I'm about half done. Good. And say, Rochester, I've been meaning to tell you. I might be entertaining some important delegates from the conference, like, well, like Anthony Eden. And I want you to be very dignified. Dignified? Yes, I want you to speak with a broad A. You know, can't, don't, command, and so on. Now, repeat this sentence after me. I can't dance this afternoon as I have paint on my pond. Oh, boss, this is so silly. <laughs> There's nothing silly about it. Now, repeat it. Okay. I can't dance this afternoon as I have paint on my pond. That's very good, Rochester. And remember it when I'm entertaining in San Francisco. Now, let's get on with the packing. I'll take my socks and put them in a small bag and put my handkerchief. Answer the phone, Rochester. Are you there? <laughs> this is the residence of Jack Benny, star of the cinema, legitimate drama, and wireless. Autographed photographs, two for a shilling. Men of the Army, Marines, or His Majesty's Navy, Hawk Price. Hey, come again? Oh, this is most distressing. Most distressing. Right home, I'll tell it. Cheerio, pip, pip. <laughs> Who was that, Rochester? Your tailor, sir. He said you can't dance this afternoon unless you pay in advance for your pants. Now, <laughs> cut that out. You don't have to begin till we get to San Francisco. Now, you finish packing while I go into my vault and get some money. Cross over the moat to the safe. Halt! Who goes there? Oh, it's only me, Ed. I want to get into my safe. Oh, it's you, Mr. Benny. Yes. Well, we're having very lovely weather now, Ed. It's spring again. Spring? That must be nice. <laughs> By the way, Ed, I've got some good news for you. The war in Europe is over. Germany surrendered on Tuesday. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, did they, uh... Did they catch the Kaiser? <laughs> no, no, Ed, that was... Oh, I'll explain it to you some other time. Right now, I'd like to open my safe. Very good, sir. Shall I put on my blindfold? <laughs> of course not, Ed, of course not. I trust you. <laughs> now, let's see. The combination is right to 45, left to 160, back to 15... Then left to 110. There. <laughs> Will I need? I'll be in San Francisco for ten days. There'll be hotel bills, meals, entertainment, tips. Fifteen dollars ought to be enough. <laughs> Maybe I should take twenty. Nah, if I take a lot, I'll just spend it. <laughs> I'll take fifteen. But then again, maybe I'll need twenty. Oh well, I'll play safe and take seventeen fifty. <laughs> there. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye, Ed. See you in the fall. I'll be here. <laughs> well, come on, Rochester. We better hurry to the station. Yeah. 
I hope my gang is here. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Mazusa, and Cucamonga. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Mazusa, and Cucamonga. Rochester, check my bag. I'm going over to the information booth to make sure about the time our train leaves. Yes, sir. Uh, pardon me, are you the information clerk? Well, what do you think I am in this cage? A bird of paradise? <laughs> and I always have to run into him. Look, I'm going to San Francisco. Well, well, don't tell me the La Brea Tar Pits is sending a delegate to the conference. <laughs> Don't be funny. All I want to know is when my train leaves for San Francisco. And if you won't tell get me... Get your hands off my desk. I just want to look it up on Stop the... Stop crumpling my time paper. Then will you please tell me what time my train leaves for San Francisco? Well, which train do you want to go on? The lark or the owl? Well, what's the difference? The lark can sing, silly. <laughs> look, I want to go on the... Track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Oh, there's Mary and Phil. Here I am, kids. Hurry up, Jack. Our train's about to leave. Come on, Jackson. Okay, I'll be right with you. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Rum and Cucamonga. Rum and Cucamonga. Mary, Phil, stop dancing. Our train, please. program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, on this momentous occasion, we're broadcasting from the magnificent Civic Auditorium in historic city of San Francisco. San Francisco, known the world over for its luxurious buildings, its beautiful Golden Gate, its extensive harbor, its gigantic and impressive bridges. And by the time he gets to me, I won't mean a thing. <laughs> now I know how Berkeley feels. <laughs> So from this colorful city, we bring you that Yankee Doodle Dandy, Jack Benny. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking, and Don, it certainly is thrilling to be here in San Francisco. A city that reminds me so much of Waukegan. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. I don't blame you for being proud of your hometown, but let's not be ridiculous. Ridiculous? Are you kidding down? Mention one thing that San Francisco has that Waukegan hasn't got. Well, uh, Waukegan doesn't have the bridges, the Golden Gate, Fisherman's Wharf, paved streets, electric lights, department stores, <laughs> automobiles, bicycles... Trees. Ha, and... ha, I knew if I let you go, you'd hang yourself. We've got bicycles. <laughs> they may have high front wheels, but we've got them. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do agree with you, Don. San Francisco is a beautiful city. Ah, you bet it is, Jack. But a funny thing happened to me this morning when I was walking down Knob Hill. Walking down Knob Hill? Yes. When I got halfway down, I stopped to rest. And a traffic cop came over and made me point my toes into the curb. <laughs> Well, you can't blame him, Don. If you ever started rolling, you flatten everything south of Market Street. <laughs> you know, when, when you're out for a stroll, you look like a walking plenary session. <laughs> You've got plenty of plenary there, brother. <laughs> too, huh, and, Don, have you noticed how crowded it is here in San Francisco? It was just fortunate that I made my reservations eight months ago. Oh, well, then you were lucky, Jack. Where are you living, at the top of the mark? No, at the bottom of the Lancashire. <laughs> But it's really beautiful down there. You can look up and see the bay. You know? <laughs> of course, after five days, I had to give up my room, and I'm now living at the Claremont Hotel in Berkeley. You know, that's near Oakland. 
But, Jack, you come over to San Francisco so often with that toll bridge. Don't you find it rather expensive crossing the bay? Not at all, Don. It just happens that I brought my bathing suit with me. <laughs> you know, huh? Well, Jack, isn't that a little dangerous? It wasn't until yesterday the Coast Guard came out after me. They thought I was a German submarine giving myself up. <laughs> I wouldn't have minded that so much, but they fired a shot across my bow. Fortunately, I was bowing at the time. <laughs> Hiya, Jackson. All right, folks, you're all in clover because Harris is here and the law is over. <laughs> hey, Phil, how are you enjoying San Francisco? Oh, it's great, Dante. This is really a pretty village, especially at night. When you're looking down at the city from the top of a tall building and all the colored lights are flashing on and off, Gosh, it's beautiful. Looks just like a pinball machine. <laughs> oh, fine. Comparing San Francisco to a pinball machine. Sure, Jackson. The whole town is tilted. <laughs> tilted? Yeah, Frankie, my guitar player, says it's the first time he's ever been sober in the city cockeyed. <laughs> well, I hope the change wasn't too much of a shock to him. By the way, Phil, where are you and Frankie living? Well, we couldn't find the room, Jackson, so we've been spending all our time up the top of the mark. Oh, that must be beautiful. Yeah, what a view. On a clear day, you can see the bar. <laughs> I know, I know. And say, Jackson, you want to hear something cute? Why? Well, last night, Frankie had a couple of drinks. And you know those big turntables they have at the end of the cable car line? You mean those turntables that revolve the, ca uh, they revolve the cable cars on? Yeah, well, Frankie kept watching them all one night. Then huh? finally he walked over to the conductor and said, Listen, chum, I've been here for seven hours. When are you going to put on one of Crosby's records? <laughs> Well, Phil, I can understand Frankie standing there for seven hours. What were you doing there? I was waiting for that's what I like about the salad. <laughs> well, Phil, all I can say... Well, here comes our little songbird. Hello, Larry. Hello, Mr. Benny. Larry, I was looking for you all week to find out what you're going to sing today. Where are you living? Oh, I'm at the Sir Francis Drake. I have a lovely room overlooking... A room overlooking what? I don't know. It hasn't got a window. Oh. <laughs> well, it's so crowded here, they probably stuck you in a broom closet. Go ahead, kid. Let's have your song. Come on. Let's have it. <laughs> Phil, someday I'd like Hello, to... Hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Someday I'd like to... Wait a minute. You're not Mary. No, I'm Rita Hayworth. Oh, Rita Hayworth. Rita, this is certainly a surprise. What are you doing here? Well, Jack, I stopped in to visit Mary at her hotel, and she had a very bad cold. Oh, yes. I bet I know how she caught that cold. She crossed the bay with me and didn't bring a towel. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too bad. I know that Mary would have been thrilled to be here. She really well, wouldn't. Anyway, Jack, Mary asked me to come over here and take her place. Well, that's awfully sweet of you, Rita, and naturally, I don't expect you to do this for nothing. I suppose Mary told you that I'll pay you the same salary that I'm paying her. Yes, but I came anyway. <laughs> oh, Rita, you little vixen you. But no kidding, I'm so glad you're here because, well, I wanted to tell you that I've often... In fact, I... No, I'd better not say it. Huh? <laughs> what is it, Jack? You can tell me. No, you'll only think I'm a silly kid. No, I won't. I promise. Well, okay, I'll confess, Rita, that I, little Jack Benny, have often dreamed about you. Why, I think that's sweet. Oh, but Jack, when you dreamed about me, did you ever dream that I'd be on your program? No, I always kept business out of it. <laughs> uh, say, Rita, while you're here in San Francisco, where are you staying, in Berkeley or Oakland? Oh, I have a very nice room right here at the Palace Hotel. The Palace Hotel? Right here in town? Yes. Well, imagine getting a room right... What have you got that I haven't got? Mm, nothing, nothing, but I'm supposed to walk that way. <laughs> Got that over with a bang, kid. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Hayworth, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your latest Columbia musical tonight and every night. I thought you were wonderful in it. Thank you, Don. Oh, yes, I saw it, too. And by the way, Rita, I have a picture playing here in San Francisco this week. It's called The Horn Blows at Midnight. And it's doing terrific business. Yes, I know, Jack, but uh, don't you think you're unfair trying to cash in on Bing Crosby's reputation? Well... Imagine I... changing the title from The Horn Blows at Midnight 
to blowing my way. <laughs> well, I know what I'm doing, sister. I'm a businessman, you know. Well, Jack, if you're such a businessman, why did you jip the cable car company out of their fare? What do you mean, Jip? I saw you on Powell Street. Huh? When you thought no one was looking, you walked out in the middle of the street, got down on your knees, stuck your finger in the slot, hooked it around the cable, and let it pull you up the hill for nothing. <laughs> oh, I just did that for a gag. You know, people expect me to be funny. Hey, Jack, but after the show, I got a little spot and we'll, uh... Hey, who's this happy little bundle of Technicolor? <laughs> Okay, okay. Rita, I'd like you to meet whispering Phil Harris. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Oh, brother, all this in a salary, too. This is it. I bet if she ever walked into the conference, she'd be whistled at in 46 different languages. <laughs> well, you know, Rita, the minute I seen you, I knew you were my type. Slow down, Phil. She's married. She's married to Orson Welles. Who's he? <laughs> Rita, you tell him. Well, my husband is an actor, a writer, a director... A producer, a columnist, and a commentator. Well, if he's that busy, what am I worried about? <laughs> well! <laughs> Don't mind him, Rita. He just came with the band. The union says you gotta have one. <laughs> oh, he doesn't bother me, Jack. And I think I'd better be running along now. See you later. Wait a minute, Rita. What's your rush? Where are you going? Well, I've got to hurry over to the Bay Bridge, and there's such a crowd there, I want to get a place close to the rail. Close to the rail? Why? Well, I understand every afternoon, some eccentric fellow swims across the bay. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> well, it takes all kinds of people to make a world. <laughs> anyway, Rita, thanks very much for coming over, and I'm sure Mary appreciates it, too. Goodbye. So long, Jack. Ah, it was nice of her to come over and leave Orson all by himself. And now... <laughs> you like that one, Orson? And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, as an added attraction, we have another surprise for you. A very dear friend of mine who has entertained the boys overseas in both theaters of war and is preparing to go again. The world's greatest harmonica player, Larry Adler. Rhapsody Americana, played by Larry Adler. Larry, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jack. You pronounced it so well, too. Jack, we certainly had a lot of fun on, on those overseas trips, didn't we? We sure did. And, Larry, when you played your harmonica, the boys really went for it. I know, Jack. And when you played your violin, the boys really went. Hmm. I'd answer that, but I have another important introduction to make. Oh, who are you going to introduce now, Jack? The governor of California. You mean the governor is here? Yes. What have we done now? Nothing. <laughs> And now, one of the honored guests here, Governor Earl Warren. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Jack. Gosh, Governor, I'm so excited. You know, this is the first time I've ever had a governor on my program. I don't know how to act. I mean, I, I don't know what to do. Well, for one thing, stand up. You don't have to curtsy. Oh, oh, oh I didn't know. <laughs> well, Jack, I just want to tell you how happy we are to have you here in San Francisco at this time. I did meet one very important person who really knows what it's all about. In fact, I had lunch with him twice. His name is Mr. Dyer. Edward Dyer. Edward J. Dyer? Yes. Do you happen to know him? Well, I should. He's my chauffeur. <laughs> Well, he's a, he's a lovely fellow. Anyway, Governor, it's been a great pleasure to be here in San Francisco, and my cast and I feel highly honored having been asked to appear on this program. <laughs> Goodbye, Governor. Goodbye, Jack. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter, Jack? I meant to ask the governor to come to the big reception I'm giving in my honor tonight. You know, um, Mayor Lapham is going to be there, too. Mayor Lapham? Yeah, he's the one who wears those zoot neckties, you know. Oh. Those things. <laughs> well, I'll get in touch with the governor later, and I'm sure he'll... There's the phone. I'll get it. 
Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Ron Jeffrey. <laughs> Hello, Rochester, what is it? I wanted to let you know that everything is all set for the reception you're giving tonight. Well, I hope you explained it was absolutely free. Uh-huh. And I also explained that you would have a plate by the door in case any in case they wanted to show their appreciation. Rochester, that plate is there for calling cards. It never was before. <laughs> Well, I'll talk to you about that later. Will you be home when I get there? Gone! Ah! Ah! All right, all right, goodbye. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, today we're coming down the home stretch of our radio season. So, before starting our final show, let's go out to Jack Benny's house where Jack is uh, taking another violin lesson from his famous French music teacher, Professor LeBlanc. But before we go, let me ask you a question. Can it be the trees that fill the breeze with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no, it isn't the trees. It's... No, no, Mr. Benny, no. I keep telling you, not that way. Try it again. Yes, sir. I've done so many exercises, I'd rather play something like souvenir. Very well, very well. Play it, play it, anything. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, Mr. Benny, not me. Maybe I ought to get my other violin. If you've got strings on it, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> okay, shall I try souvenir again? Maybe later, but right now, let us get back to the exercises. And this time I will count for you. Uh, yes, sir. It's one and two and three and four. And... Watch the note that you are striking, bend your thumb, you're not hitchhiking. <laughs> Maybe not a little thinner, I don't want to lose my dinner. <laughs> I am sorry I left Paris, you are even worse than Harris. <laughs> mm, Monsieur Benny, Monsieur Benny, how long have you been playing the violin? Oh, I play the violin since, well, since I was a little baby. A little baby. Yeah, in fact, if you look closely on my violin, you can see my teeth marks. And so, Benny, after hearing you play, those could be anybody's. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm paying you to teach me, not to insult me. If I'm not playing so well today, maybe it's because my fingernails are too long. Long fingernails have nothing to do with it. Well, your fingernails are short. They were long when I came in here. <laughs> Sitting them on the rock. <laughs> For heaven's sake. Maybe I can spend it a little longer. Just ten more minutes and the lesson she is through. Finished. That's right. Then you will give me the other half of that five dollar bill. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Now, if you don't mind, I'll go back to Steuben here. I wouldn't care if you went back to Waukegan. <laughs> what? It's no use. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. But, Professor, I am going back to the cash bar. Goodbye. <laughs> hmm. What a 
sentimental fellow he is. Oh, Rochester. Rochester. Hmm, he must have gone out, and I told him I wanted him to drive me to the studio. Oh, well, I'll call Mary. She'll drive me over. <laughs> Mary, not so fast. Oh, Jack, why is it every time I draw you're so jittery? I can't help it. I'm as nervous as a cat. Well, stop arching your back and sit down. <laughs> and don't drive so fast. Well, if you don't like the way I drive, why don't you take a taxi cab? You know very well why. The last time we rode in a cab, we had that horrible accident. Oh, yes. Yeah. The cab hit a bump and the meter jumped a dollar and a half. <laughs> Besides, my insurance covered it. <laughs> but anyway, as long as I'm riding with you, take it easy. And Jack, next time get Rochester to drive you to the studio. Well, he was supposed to, but he left the house without letting me know. I wonder where he went. He's up to the... Mary, look out! Oh, there you go again. Turn on the radio and relax. Okay. I'll turn on the short way. Maybe I can get some police calls. Calling police cars 17, 21, and 43... Calling cars 17, 21, and 43. Drive your cars to the corner of 4th and Vermont and see Madman Munt. He'll give you the craziest prices. <laughs> hmm, I better try another station. Does Vivian know that her sister Edith is trying to steal her husband? Will Gwendolyn be arrested for putting arsenic in William's cream de mint? <laughs> When will they realize that their innocent-looking boarder, Mr. Winterbottom, is really a Japanese saboteur? And the tramp who's sleeping in their cellar is none other than Robert Dalton of the FBI. <laughs> when will Mother realize that the sticky stuff which is ruining her victory garden is the start of an oil gusher which will make them all millionaires? <laughs> Tune in again this time tomorrow for another chapter of the Johnsons, a typical American family. <laughs> Now, you know, that's my favorite serial program. Oh, last week you said the same thing about the adventures of Matilda Cronkite, girl horse doctor. <laughs> well, I guess I'm the fickle type. I'll get another statement. Ladies and gentlemen, are you embarrassed by getting five o'clock shadow at 3.30? <laughs> Do you suffer from moist, oily skin? Would you like to have your hide dry? <laughs> Then why not try sympathy to <laughs> I'd like to miss him right now. Why? And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the feature spot on our program where we interview interesting personalities from all walks of life, I bring you the butler of a very famous man. Your name, please. Rochester Van Jones. Jack, did you hear that? Yeah, so that's where he went. Now, Rochester, I understand that you've been in Mr. Benny's employee for over ten years. Yes, sir. You must be very proud to be working for a man like Jack Benny. Yes, sir. Proud and tired. Hmm. Well, 
that's strange. I always thought Mr. Benny was an easy man to work for. Easy? You remember what Mr. Churchill told England about blood, sweat, toil, and tears? Yes. Well, so far I've done everything but bleed. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, Rochester, I'd like to bring up an interesting question. Is Mr. Benny really as cheap in private life as he is on the radio? No, no, he loosens up on the radio. <laughs> hmm. I wonder what makes him like that. Well, Mr. Benny believes that money is the root of all evil, and he's trying to purify the human race. <laughs> well, that's silly. After all, he hasn't got all the money in the world. No, but he's got most of it, and he knows where the rest of it is. <laughs> Imagine blabbing about my private affairs. Quiet, Jack. This is what every girl should know. Oh, yeah? Now, Rochester, there's one more question I'd like to ask you. There's been a lot of speculation about Mr. Benny's age. Would you tell us how old he really is? Thirty-six. Hmm. It's about time he got to the truth. <laughs> well, how do you know? He's been thirty-six ever since I've known him. <laughs> hmm. hmm. And there are very few people still living who can contradict him. <laughs> Mr. Benny in person, and it's hard to believe he's only 36. You ought to see him in the morning before I get him assembled. <laughs> assembled? Yes, sir. Hair, shoulders, muscles, girdles. He goes together like a jigsaw. <laughs> I'll certainly tell him a thing or two when he gets home. Well, Rock. Hey, that program is on. Very good indeed. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I say, sir, Jack isn't here yet. Uh, what do you think we ought to do? Don't worry, don't you don't worry. I can handle it. Give me that microphone. How you folks at the Phil Harris talking? You know, the Down Beach Larry Grant. Hey, Don, on my way to the studio this afternoon, I dropped into the bar, and W.C. Fields was there buying drinks for everybody. W.C. Fields was buying everybody drinks? Yes, that's what I like about the South. Oh, Harris, there's so many so much of the public. You ought to be rice and you. You ought to be rice and you, girl. Yes, sir. You know, Don, every day W.C. Fields drinks a whole quart. Drive your blues away! And now, folks, I want to say... Okay, kids, okay, I'm here. Sorry, you're late, fellas. Oh, hello, Mary. Hiya, Jackson. Well, it was entirely my fault, fellas. I was taking a violin lesson, and I completely lost track of the time. Well, how do you like that? This is the first time you've ever been late, Jack, and it had to happen on our last program. Our last program? What have we done now? <laughs> Well, we haven't done anything. Maybe that's why it's our last program. <laughs> Stop being funny. We're only, off, we're only off for the summer, and we'll be back in the fall. Well, this is a fine time to tell us we're going off the air. I just hired a new trefinguist for my band. A new what? Trefinguist, the guy who plays the trefingo. <laughs> Phil, Phil, there's no such instrument as a trefingo. I know, but the union says you've got to have one. <laughs> I still say there's no... Oh, say, Jack, I meant to tell you, Larry Adler called up and said he was going to drop in to rehearse those numbers you're going to do with him on your overseas tour. Oh, yes, I'm expecting, Larry. And, kid, listen, when I come back in the fall, I want you to know that we're all going to be together again. For the same sponsor, the same station, at the same time. And, and the, the same, same salary. salary. Yup. And now, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> since this is the... Hey, Mr. Uh, Benny, who's going to take our place this summer? Oh, our summer show is going to be Wayne King and his incomparable music. Wayne King, if they wanted unconquerable music, why didn't they hire my orchestra? <laughs> why didn't they hire your orchestra? You tell them, Mary. Why didn't they hire your orchestra? You tell them, Don. If this ever gets back to me, I'm stuck. <laughs> You're stuck and you've got an extra trefingo player to keep you company. <laughs> A trefingo is. Imagine an instrument of trefingo. Whoever, only Phil would know about trefingo. There is another musician in the world that would know about a trefingo. There's no such a thing. Say, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a surprise for you. What is it, Mary? You know who else is coming back on the air in the fall? Who? Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Yeah, he'll be on the same day you are and on the same network. Well, I'll be... So Allen finally got a job, huh? <laughs> 
Who's he going to be with? Standard brand. I don't mean his jokes. I mean his sponsor. <laughs> Boy, will I fix him in the fall. And now, folks, since this is our last... Pro- Come in. Hello, Jack. Well, Larry Adler. Hello, Larry. Larry, did you bring your harmonica with you so we can rehearse for our trip? Yes, Jack, I did. And I also brought along a new musical instrument, which I just invented. A new musical instrument? Mm Mm-hmm. It's made out of a comb, a piece of tissue paper, and a burned-out electric bulb. 60 watts. (laughs) A comb? A piece 60 watts was ad lib. (laughs) Now, you know what I hate about when they put in extra words that takes up time and you run over length? You know what I mean? Why can't they leave scripts just the way they're written? It's a very good idea. We thought that thing. was funny. We would have written it in. <laughs> a comb, a piece of tissue paper, and a burnt-out electric bulb. What do you call an instrument like that? <clears throat> a trefingo. <laughs> oh, so that's a trefingo. Well, look, Larry, how about rehearsing our stuff? I'll grab my violin. We'll go to work. Okay. Something oh. Spanish. Wait a minute, Jack. Yeah. Why don't you let Larry play a number first? Something he's going to do alone. All right. Come on, Larry. 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 Okay, Larry, what's it going to be? I'm going to play Laura. Swell. Greatest to single is. I'm going to do together. Mary, hand me my violin, will you? Okay. You can touch it with your bare hands. You don't have to put on a glove. (laughs) Thanks. Come on, Larry. Let's try a hot tune. Okay. Wait a minute.